um, is a very good way to motivate other students like my age to get out there and vote. And um, I am calling Maria Peinado forward. Um, whenever you are ready, please step forward to the panelists section. We will go ahead and um, be ready to ask you some questions. Good morning, can you hear me? Good morning, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Is it just me or does it look a little blurry? Looks there a little blurry, ma'am. Okay. But you Sorry. are visible and your voice is coming through nicely. Okay, thank you. Well, um, thank you so much for having me and giving me some time to share um, what my campaign is about and, and you know, why we're, we're ready for office. So good morning, moderators. Good morning, hosts. Good morning, Marlene. Um, everyone, thank you so much. So I'll, I'll get started. Um, my name is Maria Peinado. I am running for Central Union High School District uh, trustee um, to be on the school board. I'm, this is the first time I run for office. Uh, I am a parent of, re of a recent graduate. Um, my background, I'm uh, raised in Imperial Valley. I am the daughter of a bracero. I'm a proud daughter of a bracero. Um, my, my father worked in the ag fields in Imperial Valley for over 30 years. Um, so I come from an immigrant um, farm worker family. I'm a first generation college student, um, straight out of high school. I uh, attended University of California, San Diego, and I majored in political science. Um, and then after getting some experience in San Diego, I decided to return home, um, come, come home. And I've been back in the Valley ever since. Um, so I think I'm ready for the school board because I feel that our school boards need, need parent representation and mm -hmm. either parents who have uh, students in, in the district or recent graduates of this dis district. And I'm the parent of a recent graduate. Um, and I, I feel very strongly about that. Um, I also want to make sure that uh, I am a voice for students who are mo more vulnerable or marginalized. For example, students who are special education, um, students who are immigrants, um, first ge generation college bound, um, foster youth. Um, I really want to make sure that those students are not falling through the cracks and are getting the support they, they need and they deserve. Um, I, I was also a very involved parent at um, Southwest High School. My son was in orchestra and mariachi. So I was always, a, you know, the parent attending the meetings, helping with the fundraisers. Uh, I love music. I love the performing arts because I've seen the effect, the positive effects that music and the performing, performing arts have for our students. So I'm a big advocate of having students with special needs involved and completely um, integrated into all our programs, into sports, into music, um, because I think that is full inclusion. That's full inclusion to me. So I'm a big advocate for students and I'm a resource for parents. Um, I made a tons of hours of research, researching scholarships and summer programs for my son. And so I make that information available to whoever wants it. So I really feel that I'm a resource for parents. Uh, I, I've seen what works. Um, and I'm willing to share that information to improve our schools. I really feel that our, our schools um, are, they're doing, they're doing a good job, but they, we can do so much better. We really need to raise our standards um, and, and our expectations for the students. And I feel that if we do raise the bar, our students are going to be able to meet it. Um, and then I think most importantly, I work in the public health department. I'm a public health professional with over 20 20 years experience. So I will bring that to the table. And I think that's what's unique about me. Right now, in the middle of this pandemic, we need somebody with a public health background. And I can fill that, um, that void and I can uh, provide that knowledge. Um, I, I, I feel that we really need to have somebody with public health because of all the important decisions we're making right now um, as a result of the pandemic. We need to prioritize the health and the safety of all students and the staff. Oh, uh, Maria, and that was uh, the three minute mark as well. Okay, right thank there. you. Yeah, of course, thank you. 
Thank you so much for sharing, Maria. Um, before we go ahead and begin with the questions, I just wanted to go ahead and give a brief statement here. There are six candidates running for the Central Union High School Board. Four are running for the three four-year positions. Two are running for one two-year positions. Maria is the only candidate who is running for the high school district in El Centro who responded to the questionnaire, and she is running for the four-year position. So thank you again for sharing your opening statement, Maria. I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions, okay? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, and you answered a little bit about this in your opening statement, but feel free to um, just maybe reiterate some concepts, okay? So, Sorry. why is the position you're running for important for the Impro Valley? Why did you decide to run? So, again, um, I was a very involved parent in the high school and um, I wanted to share that information. I've always been a resource for parents. Um, I've always had parents asking me, you know, how we did certain things or how I was able to work with my son. And so I've always been sharing that information. So I felt, well, let's let's do this officially. Let's do this as, as a school board member. We'll all be able to amplify that information. Um, again, because right now we're in the middle of this pandemic, I feel that we really need to have a public health voice on the board. The decisions that we're making as a, as a board within in the next year and the next months are going to be imperative to prioritizing the health and the safety of all our staff and our students. And I want to make sure that we have that voice on the board. Um, and I think that that is especially important right now. Um, again, I um, have been involved in the school. I was a the school sites council parent rep representative for a year. I've been part of the community advisory committee for the special education local plan area, the, the SELPA. Um, so I bring that experience. I've, I've made sure that I do a lot of research um, into special education. I've known, I've joined national organizations like the um, COPA, which is the Council of Parents, Attorneys and Advocates. It's a national network of parents who are advocating for students with special needs. So I think I can really bring that to the table. I also bring to my, the table the networks that I have established, not only in Imperial County, but throughout the state of California for students um, who need to, who want to access leadership, leadership programs like the Chicano Latino Youth Leadership Program in Sacramento, the Inland Empire Future Leaders Program in San Bernardino, the College Project, which is a project to um, help students who are special needs going to, to college. It's, it's like a one week camp. I have those connections and I want to be able to bring those locally, amplify them and share them with our parents and let them know what is out there and what is available for students. Um, so I think that is what I bring to the board. I've also been a MANA, the Imperial Valley volunteer and board member for over 13 years. I Maria. was. And that was time for the two minutes as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Maria. Um, secondly, I'd like to ask you, what do you do as a board member to ensure that the district is committed to diversity and hiring of teachers, administrators, and other staff that reflects the diversity of our community? Okay, so, so the question is, what have I done or how will I plan to do that? How will you plan? Okay, so again, this is my first time running for office. Um, so I feel that um, we really need to kind of see the background of the staff and then the administration. Um, and also we need to support our youth that's going through school right now so that they want to come back and work in our district. I we need to, um, we need to support them for success, not for failure. Um, one of the things that I noticed uh, throughout these years is that we do a good job of telling the students what the A through G requirements are, telling them, you know, um, you know which colleges are good. But I, I don't think we do enough of a job of, with the financial training, with um, financial literacy, um, especially those who are from low income families. Um, we need to link them up with support programs once they're in college so that they don't fall through the cracks uh, because even though they have financial aid, some of them continue being low income. So we really need to make sure we, we prepare them for success. Um, and then making sure that, you know, these students that go on to higher education um, are supported so that they want to come back and be those um, mentors 
for the for the next generation. Um, those that's a really good model that a lot of the leadership programs that I've seen use. They use the alumni from from delegates and they bring them back as mentors. And I feel that if we can do that in our district, that will diversify our district as well. Um, who better to teach our students than, than those who know what they're going through and who can relate to them. I think we need to have staff and we need to have teachers who can relate to the students um, who have you know, come from their background. I think that's gonna be very, very important. And again, it starts with us. It's really depending on us as a board to, to encourage that and to support those programs. We need to support Abbott. We need to support Upward Bound. We need to support those college preparation programs for our students so that, um, you know, if they do go on to education um, or educational administration, that they want to come back and work in our district and they want to give back to um, our schools. All right, Maria. And that was uh, time for the two minute mark as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Maria. Um, I will go ahead and share a brief statement with the audience. I just would like to inform everyone that if you have any questions mm -hmm. for for Maria, um, please go ahead and use the Q&A function. We can take questions through there. Um, next, I'm gonna go ahead and um, give you our third question. Okay, Maria? Okay. Alrighty, so what would be your top three priorities if elected? What is the single most important challenge facing the community you will be elected to represent? What will you do to address this challenge? So again, right now, the single most, um, the biggest challenge that we have in our school district in all school districts throughout the nation right now is the pandemic. And so that is that that is priority right now, as well as online learning um, that is affecting everything. I mean, we have had to do 100 percent pivot in the last few months, and it's it's been cha world changing, not only for the staff, but for the students. So I also, I also feel that for the parents who are at home, we need to support the parents because many there's a digital um, divide and some of the parents are not prepared to support or they don't know how to support their students at home as they're doing online instruction. So we need to make sure we provide the parents as well, the tools so they can be better prepared to support the students. Um, Again, uh, public health is a priority for me, making sure that we prioritize the health and the safety of the students and the staff. Um, and first and foremost, that, that's the most important. Secondly, I think we, again, inclusion, making sure that our, the youth who are mar marginalized are not falling through the cracks. We need to prevent regression. Um, academic regression in our migrant um, ed students, in our foster youth, in our special education. I'm especially concerned about a special ed program um, and how we're getting resources to them in a timely manner and not having them wait until we all come back to what was normal again, because I don't think we're ever going to go back to the way it was again. This Everything that's happening right now, I believe is going to move us forward, but I don't think we're ever going to go back to how things were. Um, so again, I think we need to prioritize those students who are in danger of regressing academically because it's going to be so much um, harder to bring them back to where they need to be. So I think we need to prioritize that. And we also need to make sure that as we're looking at all these um, different things that we don't forget to support the arts because the arts can be therapeutic. And we need to make sure that we provide and continue providing arts programs for our students, even though we're doing online instruction. Okay, Maria. And that was time as well. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, I will go ahead and we will give you another three minutes, Maria. Thank you so much. If you would like to just um, give your closing statement. So again, um, like I said, I am um, I'm, I'm a lifelong advocate for students, especially students in special education. That's very dear and close to my heart. Um, I prioritize um, scholarship. I was a scholarship coordinator for Mana de Emperor Valley for two years. And so I, I made sure that all our students, all our schools receive that information. Um, I feel that I can use the networks that I've established locally, regionally, um, statewide, and nationally to help our district. Um, as a daughter of a Bracero worker and a native of Imperial Valley, I really understand the unique needs of our community, especially our parents um, and our migrant and agricultural background families. 
Um, I feel that I love this community. I grew up here and I came back here because I love this community and I want to make sure I do what I, I can to improve our district. Um, so I, I want to say that uh, I hope to earn the vote of El Centro residents. Um, I hope to earn the vote um, so I can actually be on the board and make a difference. Um, I'm a big believer of education uh, and, and I'm a big fan of Jaime Escalante. And I want to leave with this quote because I really believe this um, in my heart with a passion. He said, if we expect kids to be losers, they will be losers. If we expect kids to be winners, they will be winners. They rise or fall to the level of the expectations of those around them, especially their parents and their teachers. And I really believe that is true. Um, so I say, let's raise the level of expectations for ourselves so that we can raise the standards for our students. Vote for me on November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. We will have you rejoin the attendees. And next we have the El Centro Elementary School District candidates coming up. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Maria. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we'll be sending um, our next mo uh, moderate panelist, Raul Rorena, to moderate for the El Centro Elementary School District. And again, um, there is optional questions to be asked in the Q&A section of this Zoom meeting. All right, Raul, and you can go. Hmm? Hola, muy buenos dias. Uh, my name is Raul Ureña. I'm a resident of Calexico. I'm a recent graduate of UC Santa Cruz. I'm back home, and I'm going to be moderating this El Centro Elementary portion of this panel. Um, at this point, uh, we're going to put in uh, Mr. Arrevalo, Mr. Rosas, Mr. Minix, Ms. Dunham, and Mr. Fisher uh, forward for their opening statements. Um, have they joined the panel? Yes, they've all joined the panel, uh, and I'm promoting them as we speak. Uh, okay, there we go. Excellent. And Raul, do you want all of them on the panel all at once, or would you like each in turn? Uh, put, put them all on the panel. Very good. Okay. I see Mr. Arevalo, Mr. Fisher. Correct me if you have a different pronouns, please. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. We're going to start with opening statements first. Uh, each panelist, uh, each candidate will be given three minutes to complete their opening statement. We'll go ahead and start with the Shred. All righty. Well, first and foremost, thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Revelo, and I'd like to begin by first acknowledging every individual participating in the civic process uh, to better serve our community. Um, it is an absolute honor to be among so many champions and advocates of the Imperial Valley, um, all striving for a brighter future and a better tomorrow. With that being said, I'm a lifelong resident um, citizen of El Centro. This is the only home I've ever known. If my last name sounds familiar, it's because my family has been deeply rooted in our local schools for the last 40 plus years. In fact, my father, Gregor Revelo, is currently on his 43rd year as a public educator um, in Heber right now. As a current elementary educator for McCabe, I understand exactly what our students, families, and teachers are facing amid these uncertain times. I know the frustration, I know the stress and the limitations that distance learning imposes on all of us on a firsthand account. I know the long days and the longer evenings, planning technology-infused lessons, grading assignments from digital platforms and various uh, learning management systems and praying that my technology doesn't fail in the middle of the lesson for the next day. In addition to serving in the classroom, my experience goes well beyond that. I am the 2019 recipient of the National Q Emerging Teacher of the Year Award, selected out of 27,000 California educators. 
I currently serve as a director of innovation for our IVQ board, the leading nonprofit agency that provides professional development in educational technology in partnership with ICOE for Imperial Valley teachers, administrators, and stakeholders. At the same time, I'm currently working on a panel with the US Department of Education to address the leading systemic issues in education across the country. Um, with a focus in distance learning, hybrid models of instruction, and the best practices for reopening schools. I'll also be keynoting the, few, uh, the Fall Q conference in a few weeks, the largest educational technology related conference on the West Coast, the first Imperial Valley native to ever do so. If elected, I will leverage my relevant experience with Common Core standards, next generation science standards, distance learning, and 21st century education to bridge the educational technology gap, increase math and science proficiency, and introduce personal finance curriculum. I'm ready, I'm capable, and I look forward to enacting the type of change in education that our students deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adabadlo. Uh, Ms. Dunham, your opening statement. Hello, Ms. Ms. Patricia Dunham, can you hear me? We'll come back to her. Uh, Mr. Fisher, are you there? Oh, there's there, there's Patty. Excellent. Oh. Am I on the screen? I don't see myself. Okay. Let's let's uh, turn on the camera. Um, uh, let's see. Down at the bottom, it should say start video. There you go. Oh, Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Okay. Good morning, everyone, and um, I want to thank this um, uh, social justice for inviting us so that you can hear more about us. And I'd like to share with you that I have uh, been a, well, I was born and raised in El Centro, so I'm a native, and I have grown up in the El Centro Elementary uh, School District. I went to all of the, um, my grades in um, El Central School District from kindergarten. I started at Lincoln and then I moved and I went to McKinley. I went to McKinley. Uh, we had the old school. I know most of you wouldn't know where that was, but we had the old school and they were building a brand new one. So I went to McKinley School and then uh, went to junior high and of course graduated from um, Central. So I've been in, in education uh, in the Valley, so I know the schools. And then I also wanted to be a teacher. I started wanting to be a teacher when I was five years old. So I love teaching and played with my, um, my dolls and stuffed animals and my dog. So teaching was in my, my um, innermost being. So I went to college, I went to IVC and San Diego State and I became a teacher. Uh, I went to um, Azusa Pacific College for my student teaching because I graduated early and I had an extra semester. So I went to uh, LA and did my student teaching at Azusa Pacific, a very high college, um, well known. And I came back and got a job and I was thrilled. I taught um, for 36 years in the El Central School District and had the best um, life and, and teaching career that I could ever ask for. Along with my teaching career, I did a lot of other um, activities. I was a master teacher. I helped brand new teachers. I was a student teacher, um, teacher where they gave you uh, teachers and they practice. I was very active in all of the different um, new programs that, um, would come along, I would be the first one to volunteer and love to be active. Along with uh, my teaching career, I was involved in a new program that we started with a tri-team. And um, a lot of you would not know about that, but it was a very um, special program that we took three schools and we blended them. We took Washington School and Desert Garden and De Anza and we blended all of those kids together. We bused them 
and we had them all together in uh, Washington was first and second. Third I'm and sorry, we're standing, but that's for the yeah. opening statement. Yes, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> we'll we'll no, come back to your questions. Thank you. you so thank you so much, um, Mr. Fisher. You're up next. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Good morning. Good morning, other panelists and and committee. Um, my name is Chuck Fisher. Uh, I'm currently running for the position of El Centro Elementary School Board Trustee. I have education in my DNA. My family is made up of educators from kindergarten to college professors and administrators. My wife is a retired educator and both of my daughters work with students with uh, disabilities. I'm aware of the trials and the tribulations of distance learning from listening to my daughters, uh, listening to other educators, listening to parents, listening to my grandchildren who are participants in distance learning. Uh, my employment and education began as a classified employee. That's a non-certificated employee. Then I became a credential teacher and I taught elementary school for 18 years. At that time, I was selected as a mentor teacher and I was also uh, honored to be reading teacher of the year. After earning my master's degree and my administrative credential, I became a site principal and I held that position for 18 years at three different sites, McKinley, Sunflower Elementary, and Hedrick. I was privileged to be able to belong to all three employee groups within the school district, the classified, the certificated, and the administrative. During my time with El Centro Elementary, I've assisted in designing two elementary schools. I was then most fortunate to be able to open one of those. I was the first principal at Sunflower. I spent six months before the school opened planning, ordering, uh, uh, overseeing, organizing the physical site, setting up the programs. My administrative experience has allowed me to become familiar with both local, state, and federal budgets at the site level and the district level. Although I'm retired, I keep up with the current trends. I have uh, done several long-term administrative substitute positions in both the Imperial Unified School District and the Brawley Elementary School District. I've served on the El Centro Elementary School Board for nine years. Working with the fellow board members, we've completed a parent and community engagement center. We've expanded our Imperial Valley Homeschool Academy. We have uh, added a, an additional campus to our dual immersion program. We've implemented additional STEM science labs. I would like to continue to see some of our unfinished projects finished. We're currently building a multi-purpose room gymnasium combination at De Anza. And we have a new school for the Victoria Ranch subdivision uh, at the state. Uh, that, is, that is time, time, Mr. Fisher. Thank you. Thank you for your opening statement. Uh, Mr. Minix, you're next. Thank you, thank you. This is Michael Minix, and I'm a candidate before the Board of Trustees of the El Centro Elementary School District. I have been a classroom teacher for 19 years. I served as well, a school well, administrator. Second, Mr. Minix. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, can you point the camera towards you? Before you there you go. Excellent. All right. I'm going to restart those three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Hello. My name is Michael Minix, and um, I've been a uh, classroom teacher for 19 years, and I served as a school principal for 16 years. I've been on the Board of Trustees for nine years. I've been a public servant to this community for the past 44 years. My public service is, in, as, is impeccable. I serve as a commissioner on the uh, Imperial Valley Housing Authority. Uh, I am a pastor of a local church. I'm born and raised in the Imperial Valley uh, here in El Centro. I attended the local schools uh, here in El Centro. I'm committed and I'm dedicated, and I have a proven record in leadership. 
I am the current board president of the El Centro Elementary School District. I've served for the past two consecutive years as president. I am committed to this community. I'm committed to serving the needs of our students, uh, our, our parents, and serving this community. I ran for the board because I wanted to make a difference in our community. So because of my involvement and my, and my community involvement, I decided to run for the board to help support and to make a difference in the lives of the students in which we work with daily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minix, for your opening statement. Mr. Reses, you'll be up next. Hello, Francis. Can you hear us? Let me see. Here. Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Um, is your cam camera on? Let me see. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Excellent, excellent. I will start the time. Yay! <laughs> Uh, I, I have to start by saying hello to Andrew. First time he really sees me in person. Okay. <laughs> hello, Francis. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Francis Terrazas, and I am here uh, as a candidate for the El Centro Elementary School District. The reason why uh, I am uh, so pleased to have this opportunity is to let the voters, uh, to remind the voters, uh, we have three votes for uh, school board members. and. I am asking for one of the three. Uh, as you see, we're five candidates and uh, all five uh, seem to be uh, highly qualified in one area or another. Uh, but uh, I'll brag a bit, I really sincerely feel I am the most highly qualified. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, I don't have humility in terms of uh, being able to uh, participate as a board member and with uh, the cabinet and uh, with the community. The, the position of being a board member is being a community uh, representative and uh, a policymaker. And uh, you do have to stay up to date with updates and you also have to have a heart uh, for the students, staff, uh, everybody aboard. Uh, I really uh, have been uh, involved uh, during the entire uh, uh, time that I've been out of the board. I've been out since um, December or November of uh, December of uh, uh, 19, uh, 2018. Uh, I am, uh, before that, I, I was there 13 years. So uh, as the other boards are mentioning their uh, experience and their education, uh, my education is a specialist degree in an education in psychology, uh, administrative credentials, school, school psychologist credential. Um, but most of all, I am a parent, a grandparent, uh, great grandparent, and uh, extremely involved in the school throughout the lifetime. I am asking uh, for your vote. Uh, without it, um, I will not be uh, at the board. Uh, but with it, we are working together to make this the best district and to help our students not get behind through this uh, hard times. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mr. Rezas. Thank you to all the candidates for your opening statements. We are going to move on to questions. I'm going to select one, uh, a couple questions from the audience, a couple questions from the questionnaire. I will ask a question. All candidates will answer, uh, and every question is going to have a randomized order. So we're going to start with the first question. Um, being a local ed elected official, it is important to know uh, how you, as a government member of that school board, are going to stay in touch with the community to know what is going on in the district. Um, how will you ensure that the local community is involved and connected to your campaign? And once you are in there, how will you ensure that they continue to stay uh, connected once uh, you are a member? Um, I've randomized a list and we we'll start with that question with Ms. Denon.
Hello, Patty, can you hear us? Excellent. Let me know if anybody needs that question repeated at, at any point. Patty, you're muted. Oh, there. Excellent. Could you repeat it? It was uh, mumbled. I couldn't, I couldn't hear it very clearly. Yes, I can. One second. Let me just go ahead and set up this timer for you. The, the, the question was, as someone who is running for school board, during your campaign, how will you continue to stay uh, connected to your local community? And once you are elected, how will you continue to stay connected and listening to your local community? What is your strategy? Oh, the, the, the mute button is on. Muted. Okay. There you go. Um, uh, during my campaign, I have um, been out in the community and um, sent out letters. I, I've tried to um, uh, find ways to commute, uh, commute with people and answer questions if they have any questions. And, and after elected again, I have been uh, on the school board for nine years. So I have always made myself available. Uh, my telephone number is public and I'm always willing to meet with anybody if they have a question. Uh, I will um, explain, I will get the answer if I don't know what their um, question, um, answer to that question is. And our district has always been an open door. If parents need any uh, questions answered, we're available. Our um, district office is open. If, if they ask them and they want to talk to us, uh, they would get, be able to get a hold of us. And that is our one of our visions is that parents have their needs met and that we are there for them if they have any difficulties, especially in this time we have um, opened up clearly for whatever they need. We want their experience to be highly met uh, during this pandemic time, plus any time during our, our school year. We have our parent center and we have a principal there that will meet those needs also. But as a board member, I am available for anyone. That's my, that's my position and that's my desire to help uh, parents and their children and the community. If they need to know something, I'm always available and would be glad to explain or help uh, in any situation. Thank you, Ms. Dunham, right on time, two minutes. Uh, Mr. Rasas, same question, you're up next. Hello, Mr. Rasas, can you hear us? She's still present. Okay, no, that's okay. Mr. Menix, you were, you were next anyway. Uh, welcome yeah, back well, to would Mr. you uh, repeat the question, please? Yes, of course. Uh, during your campaign, how, how do you stay connected to the community? And after you are elected, how will you continue to stay connected and listening to your community once you are elected? Thank you for that question. Uh, the one thing that I could say about that question is I didn't wait until the, uh, until my campaign started. I've always been a good listener. I've always reached out to the community. I've always been, been there for our parents, for our students, and for our families. I've been there. I have been their voice. I've gone to them and talked to them. And people that's in my neighborhood, that's on the east side, west side, north side, all parts of El Central, I've been a good listener. I've been their voice. I brought their concerns back to this board and said, these are the questions that our families have. These are the concerns that if it's safety, these are their concerns. These are the resources in which the families are, are asking for. So I want to iterate uh, to I do want to say that I've been their voice. I have been there for them. 
and I will continue, if I'm elected, to serve another term to be their voice of this community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Menix. And uh, Mrs. Terrazas has rejoined us, Johnny. Yes. Uh, back to Mr. Terrazas, I'll repeat the question for you. Hello, Francis, can you hear us? She might not be able to hear us yet. Hello, Ms. Ms. Terrazas? We'll come back to her again. Mr. Fisher, are you there? I'm here. Oh, there she is. Okay, excellent. Uh, I'm going to re-ask the question uh, that I asked the rest of the candidates. You'll have yes. two minutes to answer. The question is, um, in your campaign, how have you stayed connected to the community to listen to their concerns? And after being elected, how do you plan to continue listening to the community? That is yes. the question. Two minutes. Yes. Um, I definitely... Um, have uh, kept in mind uh, the students and one of the ways has been uh, by volunteering uh, in the schools and being part of the schools. I have got to uh, admit that Mr. Minnis is extremely active in and uh, going to the different schools. So uh, I made it a point to also do it as even after I was no longer in the board. I listened to the parents and I uh, have even gone ahead and represented them when I was on the board at the state level uh, under Region 18 to make sure that I knew, we knew firsthand what was gonna happen and how was it going to impact our parents and uh, our schools and then brought that forth uh, to our school. Uh, prior to uh, two years ago, uh, I would have been saying everything the school does, but I have to say that now the parents uh, need to have more of a voice. I definitely will include them in going through the plan of, of action that the school has in mind in being able to not just participate in a public meeting, but to have small meetings, smaller meetings, uh, might be the PTA at the school site, but have smaller meetings to be able to have them say their voice. Uh, I hope to have a page of, um, of uh, comments uh, in, in the website for the parents to be able to do so also. And uh, English and in Spanish. But I definitely uh, will continue to do that. And I definitely uh, uh, feel that it is very important to include the parents because research-wise, the students succeed when the parents are involved. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time, two minutes, Mr. Rasas. Uh, Mr. Fisher, you're up next. Do you need me to repeat the question? No, you don't need to repeat the question. Excellent. All right. uh, as a school teacher and as a school administrator, I always had an open door policy and that has certainly continued. Uh, besides the elementary school board, I'm also involved with many community activities. I've been a, I've been a board member for Court Appointed Special Advocates, CASA. We work with foster children for 25 years. I'm the board president there. I'm on the, I'm the past president of the Imperial Valley Desert Museum Society. I'm a local Kiwanis member. I'm on the, uh, a nonprofit uh, VO, Neighborhood Medical uh, uh, nonprofit. So I meet with lots of uh, groups during my community involvement. But otherwise, I'm in a real unique situation. Because I was a teacher for many years and I was an administrator for many years at three different large schools in El Centro, McKinley, Sunflower and Hedrick, lots of people know me. And so I can be at Costco, I can be at Vaughn's, I could be any place in El Centro. I was just at Smart and Final yesterday and the clerk said, hey, Mr. Fisher, I was one of your kids at Sunflower. So, uh, because I always had that open door policy as an administrator, that has sort of carried over. And so when I see people, if they have out in the community, if they have concerns, they don't have any qualms about uh, asking me and I don't have any qualms about answering them. Also, you know, social media is very, very powerful now. And um, I've looked at some social media sites and made comments and I've listened to what some of the social media comments have been and passed that information along. So 
you know, like the other said, I have an open door policy. I'm active in the community. I talk to lots of people and I have lots of parents and students that have known me for many years that are not in, are not uh, the least bit uh, shy about asking me any questions about the that, school district. That is time, Mr. Fisher. Thank you for your response. Uh, Mr. Revolu, uh, you're the last one on this question. Thank you. Now, I don't need the question again. Mm -hmm. I've made it a point to listen to our stakeholders by engaging in as many opportunities, whether that be in person or in, uh, in Zoom, as I can while following our local COVID-19 guidelines. That means having several discussions with parents, with teachers, guardians, neighbors, uncles, aunts, grandparents, and even our local business owners. As a leader, we have to be willing to listen to the concerns of the community and the people but we have to have a broad enough perspective that encompasses all of our stakeholders and all of our subgroups so that no one is left out of the conversation. That means traveling to the east side, to the north side, to the south side, to the west side, and making ourselves accessible to the general public. If elected, I will ensure that there are deep lines of communication um, established with my stakeholders. And I want their voice to be heard acknowledged and considered every time a decision is made or even just considered. That means ensuring that I've done my due diligence as a leader to foster a healthy relationship among myself and the community I serve. I want to lead with transparency, honesty, and, uh, and authenticity. I also want the people to know that I'm making the best decisions for them. Lastly, I'd also like to partner with the community by hosting events throughout the year. These events will occur in partnership with our local city council. That way members from different public agencies are working together to best support the needs of the community. At the same time, um, I've also had an open door policy, which has extended now into an open Zoom policy, right? Just yesterday, I stayed till four o'clock working with a student uh, to meet his needs and it was difficult, um, but we got through it. And as a current educator, you know, my passion leads the way to the community. You can ask any of my students, any of the parents I've served, and I'm happy to continue doing that. In fact, my number is 760-960-1304. Call me, ask me questions, Spanish or English, I'm happy to help. Thank you. And that is time. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Arevalo, for your response. Uh, we're gonna move on to another question, this time from the community. At this point, I wanna remind the community that you can uh, ask questions through Q&A feature. Um, we'll do our best to get to them. I've re-randomized the list. <clears throat> the question that came up in the community group chat was, um, as a school board member, what actions will you champion to ensure the success of English learners? I'm gonna rephrase that question just a little bit to make the note that not every English learner is a Spanish first person. There are multiple languages uh, and backgrounds that our students come from. Uh, so the question still stands, how are you gonna help the non-English speakers be successful in their educational? And we're still gonna start that question again, two minutes, uh, starting with Mr. Arevalo. Repeat the Can you repeat that again, Raul? Yeah, who was it? Sorry. Yes, yes of course. Um, in brief, as a school board member, what will you do to ensure the success of English learners? And I'm making the note that English learner is not just a Spanish speaking person, but can be a person of a non-English language of many backgrounds uh, in the school district. What will you and, do to ensure their success? And what is the full name of the first speaker, please? Mr. Uh, Andrew Arrevalo. Very good. All righty, thank you. Well, I think that's a great question. And also, um, I'm glad that you mentioned that when we are referring to English language learners, um, that doesn't simply just mean Spanish, right? Um, within our own local community, we have many different cultures. We have many different ethnic groups, as well as many different languages. So part of ensuring that, that those kids are successful is understanding and celebrating their culture, right? I mean, is, is having a support system so that these subgroups do not feel marginalized in any way, in any capacity, particularly our BIPOC students. Um, at the same time, I'd like to ensure that the parents are also supported. 
oftentimes, um, you know, we have these diversity days where we celebrate, you know, diversity, um, but, but that ju just extends to simply a day, right, or even a week. We need to ensure that students are represented in the classroom, whether that's through the actual literature, whether that's through AR books, whether that is through any form of digital multimedia, but just ensuring that those kids are also represented um, and that their language is also seen um, and introduced to our, our current um, classroom. At the same time, I'd love to invite parents um, of different cultures to come into the classroom to share so that we can learn from them, right? I remember my own experience as a student having these types of experiences um, where I got to interact with, with different cultures, um, particularly our Korean subgroup here in the, the Imperial Valley, where I've been a tutor um, for many years for them. And the great thing about this is that I still am in close communication with my students who have gone back to Korea. Um, and it is nice to, to see them and see them uh, speaking in their native tongue, as well as having conversations with me in English. That is, that is two minutes, that is time. Um, for the, before we move on for the audience, I'm sure I will use the word, uh, the acronym BIPOC, just to make that clear. That mean, BIPOC means Black Indigenous People of Color students. Uh, we're gonna move on to Mr. Fisher on the same question. Let me know if it needs to be repeated, two minutes. Mr. Chuck Fisher. You're muted, sir. I'm on mute. <laughs> when we, uh, when we uh, hire teachers in El Centro Elementary School District, we make sure that they are uh, always uh, credentialed in uh, bilingual, bicultural, uh, with a bilingual, bicultural uh, credential. Uh, additionally, we realize that a lot of the students need support at home, and many times the parents may not uh, be proficient in English. That's one of the reasons we implemented our PACE Center, Parent and Community Engagement Center. Uh, working with IVC, we have, parent, we have a parent ESL classes there. We also have uh, training programs there for parents, how they can help their children at home. Additionally, at, uh, because many of our students come in uh, to our school district and some of the upper grades at uh, Kennedy uh, uh, Junior High, we support a newcomers program where students come in and they have intensive language instruction uh, uh, at the newcomer center. Additionally, we have our migrant bilingual coordinator, Olga Kreiman, who gives our teachers workshops and uh, uh, tips on working with all students of, of many different uh, language backgrounds. So as a school board, we support many different programs that, uh, that are going to support English language learners in the classroom and in after school programs with our ACES programs, our after school ACES programs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Mr. Minix, you're up next. Um, that there's several things that that I've done for our students, and some of those things consist of the following: student uh, celebrations, uh, the uh, recognition of students for before their outstanding accomplishments in reading, math, science. Um, we've had what 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 is called red carpet uh, celebrations, where many of our students are English language learners and they succeed at high rates. Uh, we provided uh, for our students extra support services during school, before school, and after school. We've started the after school um, programs and provided our parents with support services through um, professional development for uh, parents, uh, um, support ser the services were for our students that needed for extra help. And as I said, before school and after school and during school time. So I think that these things have been very good to provide support for all of our parents. And if any of our English language learners or our families or, or, or parents would come to me either as a classroom teacher, as a site 
um, principal or even as a board member, I was there to support the parents, support the families, and provide them with the needed resources in which they requested. Thank you, Mr. Minix. Um, we're going to move on to Ms. Dunham. Same question. I am a very uh, strong advocate. I do not speak Spanish, and I think it's wonderful that we have so many areas that we can reach out to um, parents and the Pace Center. We um, have lessons and uh, classes for them, and then we celebrate it. And at the end of the year, I love seeing those parents and we reward them for their time and their um, effort of learning um, English. And in the schools, we have absolutely whatever the, the teacher needs to help um, teach the, the students from um, Spanish to English. Uh, we have the after school program, the ACEs that they can attend, and we give them individual help. And throughout the um, school, we have opportunities for um, parents to get help. Uh, our administrator in, in the area, Mrs. Kreiman and her assistants, we are there to help every parent if they reach out for us or if we know that they're uh, having a situation, we will meet up with them. And our district is very uh, honorable and we feel very blessed to be able to reach out for any languages. Sometimes um, in my classrooms, I've had other students from other um, ethnic groups and they need help. And we have to find somebody that can speak that language and help them and we're willing to do that. So we go over and beyond to help any needs, whether it's in the English to Spanish um, or Spanish to English and other languages, we have the people and the um, uh, employees that will be available for them, and especially the PACE Center. That has been an outstanding help to uh, get the parents help in helping their students with their work and that learning is, language. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Uh, thank you for your response, uh, Ms. Frances Terrazas. Uh, you're up next with the same question. Unmute there. Am I there? Okay. Um, I would like to say that uh, uh, I am a credential teacher with a B class, and I have taught English as a second language through the IBC program for 17 years. Uh, my last uh, year uh, it was an entire year project with a, which they called the Korean project, uh, where I work with uh, students from. Uh, K through high school, uh, the mothers and the fathers, and the fathers were at uh, traveling to Mexicali in a conference room meeting and working uh, with their lingua English skills. So uh, uh, I do know the importance of having a very rich uh, language based uh, program. Uh, we have uh, highly credentialed teachers in the El Centro Elementary uh, School. Uh, it took uh, from the beginning when I, uh, before I was even a board member, when they made it an expectation uh, due to the state requirement that they had to be, the teachers had to have their B clad or the clan. So uh, uh, that's one. The other one is that in, uh, the El Central Elementary School District uh, has uh, a yearly test that they give, it's the, all the schools do, the ELAC. Uh, which they uh, test the proficiency of the students and to prove that they do a very uh, in, uh, rich language, uh, rich uh, training and the teachers uh, do a good job. The reclassification rate from uh, English learners, depending on whatever culture they come from in, in, in foreign language, the reclassification rate to fluent English proficient is quite high. And those are also celebrated uh, very yeah, highly. That is, that is time, Mr. Rosas. Thank you for your That's response. It. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to move on uh, to one or two more questions, if time allows. Um, I'm going to randomize the list one more time. 
And the question uh, that is going to come up, what are your top three priorities if elected? What is the single biggest, most important challenge facing the community that you will be elected to represent? We're going to start with Ms. Terrazas for two minutes. Yes, uh, I well, the El Centro Elementary School District and all our schools are going through some very challenging times. Uh, many new things have been presented to us, and uh, uh, one of them being how our students uh, are learning and how our teachers are had to uh, get trained and still continue to be trained. Uh, I will be focusing on the retraining and uh, working with the teachers, uh, having a uh, our administration work with the teachers in supporting them, supporting them uh, to become uh, not just uh, great teachers, but also uh, a little bit, you know, the emotional strength so that that is carried over to the student. I uh, do believe uh, that we need to really sit down uh, as a board, train uh, with the cabinet in terms of putting together the uh, plan. I know that there's one uh, now, uh, it should not just be give it to us, read it, let's go back and review it slow, uh, review the, the highlights and then approve it. It should be one that uh, it, there's a buy-in, not just by the boards, but there's a buy-in by the school teachers uh, that they're updated on the regulations that the governor is putting on us and that there's a buy-in with the parents and the students. Uh, I really uh, do plan to go in, uh, fold up my shirt, uh, my shirts, uh, sleeves and just head on into uh, the retraining mode and uh, try to work to go back to school. Uh, go into either hybrid uh, uh, training where it's half and half, uh, but I did, there's definitely uh, that push going on, getting our students uh, back to the school environment, but make it make sure that it's safe for them and for the teachers. Thank you, Mrs. Tabrasas. That is exactly two minutes. Uh, We're going to move on to Mr. Andrea Revalo for the same question. All righty, thank you. My top three priorities are simple. Bridging the educational technology gap increasing math and science proficiency, and introducing personal finance curriculum. The single most important challenge facing our community is safely transitioning back into the physical classroom to support our most vulnerable subgroups in order to prevent further learning loss that comes with distance learning. COVID-19 is a disease that has directly affected my personal family. I've lost loved ones during this pandemic, and hence, protecting our kids, our families, and our staff members is of the utmost importance to me. I would make sure that distance learning throughout our schools um, in El Centro adheres to California uh, Assembly Bill, Senate Bill 98, which provides the accountability piece for our students and distance learning. At the same time, I would partner with and continue to follow the guidelines from our local Imperial County Office of Education, the Imperial Valley Health Department, and the state guidelines imposed by Governor Newsom. Once our city meets the criteria to move into a phase that allows for in-person slash hybrid learning, I would make sure that our district has a systematic con contingency plan to address sanitizing, safety conditions, and the possibility of local transmission within our schools if they did reopen. Only if and when those conditions were met, I would gradually move into a tiered reopening process so that schools would open in a 50% capacity model initially. And as conditions got better based on the quantitative data and our local positivity rate, I would continue to allow for more fluidity, movement and access across the district. As much as I want our students back in the classroom with their teachers, I wanna make sure that all of our stakeholders are protected first and foremost. Thank you, Mr. Arrabalo. I We're gonna move on to Mr. Chuck Fisher for the same question. Well, Obviously, the, the greatest force that we have uh, in education right now is COVID-19. And so uh, the, some of the goals, of course, are, are going to be in that direction. Uh, El Centro already has uh, reopening plans, but we want to make sure we have safe reopening plans that are going to protect our students, our staff, and all of our employees. We have ordered uh, 
We've ordered warehouse full of uh, material, masks, sanitizers, deodorizers, things like that. The, once we reopen, which I hope it happens in the near future, we're gonna have to do something for lost learning. From March 16th until the end of the school year, uh, we had a lot of learning loss in that period. And although distance learning is a stopgap measure right now, it's still not a replacement for the classroom. So we're gonna have to come up with some plans for lost learning for all of our uh, different stakeholders. Uh, additionally, you talked about three goals, safe reopening, lost learning, and I would love to see the new school uh, in the Victoria Ranch subdivision get completed. Those would be three priorities I would like to look at during the next term. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, we're gonna move on to Ms. Dunham for the same question. Well, um, to me, my, 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 motto, is, my motto is uh, kids first. So what I'm looking at is whatever we need to do for children, our kids, our students, that's what we will do. Just hands down, we will uh, do whatever we can. We, we started planning as soon as um, we had to shut down and have the kids do uh, online learning. And we started preparing, what can we do to help them at that particular time while they were at home learning? And we know that it's not the best learning. And we started planning and have that plan already in, in place of what we can do when we're out of this. And being a teacher all my life, I know that that's, that's the hardest thing that, that students and teachers have to go through, but we are behind them. First of all, safety first, kids first, and we will do whatever we can to bring them back. And when we come back to the classroom, we already have a plan of how we might um, be able to do that. Now, every plan isn't gonna work right away, but we're adjustable and we are willing to see what is the best. And we will do that, whatever. If we have to hire new people and we have hired new employees so that students have that one-on-one -on -one, um, connection and we will do whatever we have to do to bring the students back up to their level. Now it might take a while, but at least our students come first and safety first. And that's what we will stand on to make the kids back where they, uh, bring them back to where they need to be at this particular time. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Uh, we're gonna move on for the last respondent to this question, Mr. Michael Minix. Um, I am proud to announce that this current board has implemented a distance lear a learning plan for the El Centro Elementary School District. I am proud to announce that. This board has been proactive. When the pandemic occurred, board met with staff and management, principals, and all the stakeholders, parents and implemented a distance learning plan. We have something there to help protect our students, help protect our staff, help protect our, our families. When we open up and students aren't allowed to return, this board wants to make sure that safety first, that the safety of our students, safety of our staff, and safety of our families come first. That's real important to us. And just as Mr. Fisher said, I want another goal of mine is to make sure that the school is opened at the, in the Victoria Ranch area. I sat on this board and, and I was proud to uh, help support and I voted and I supported the bond initiative to build a new school and that school will be built in the Victoria Ranch area in the El Centro Elementary School District. So I just want to say that uh, safety first, the safety of our students, parents, staff, and our families, that's a priority in our district. And another thing that I would like to see done is provide 
extra support services to our families and to our parents. Our parents want support services in technology, and that's going to happen. Thank you, Mr. Minix. Right on time. Um, we're going to squeeze in one last question. I'm going to give everybody a minute and 30 seconds to answer this one because it's very straightforward. Um, the question from the community is, what will you do to recruit and retrain highly qualified educators? I'm going to randomize the list and we're going to do this lightning round. We're going to start with Ms. Patty Dunham. Well, for, for one thing, we have the best administrators. We have supervisors and we have people that are already trained and are the top of the line and they will be ready. And they are already working on ways and um, putting together ideas of how they can help each teacher, whatever their, their issue is, we have people on in our um, on our staff that are are trained and uh, experienced and ready to give ideas of how to meet that teacher's need when they come back and any issues that they might have to be uh, dealing with. We have people and we have we have trained them, given them opportunities to to go and find out what other people have done and to research, and they are ready. Thank you, Ms. Dunham. Um, next up is Mr. Chuck Fisher for the same question. Okay, uh, in order to attract highly uh, trained teachers, well, number one, in order to attract, you have to have a salary schedule. And we have a very uh, comparable uh, salary schedule to most other areas in the state of California. Secondly, we have support for our teachers. Uh, all of our schools have a resource teacher on staff that is available for demonstration lessons and support. Additionally, we have uh, support uh, at the district office level that can go in. We have Marco Ariano, who is our STEM coordinator, and he can go into the classroom and he can support teachers with science, technology, engineering, and math lessons. We have Susan Mian, who uh, can support teachers with a computer and distance learning activities. So we have lots of support through school sites. We have lots of support through district for uh, our, our new teachers. We have a wonderful uh, training program for our new teachers and we have wonderful support for them. But additionally, we have a salary schedule that can uh, entice people to look at our district. Thank you. Mr. Fisher, for your response, uh, we're going to be moving to Ms. Frances Terrazas for the same question. Mute. I'm there. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, uh, to hire highly qualified teachers, uh, uh, it does require uh, to do a good search. Uh, the uh, uh, local. Uh, uh, students, I mean, the local t uh, training facility uh, in San Diego uh, for a while, San Diego State for a while had not been training on that. And uh, while we were uh, seeking uh, teachers uh, through the district, uh, we made it a point that the salary schedule uh, continued to raise, not just the COLA, but also continued to be uh, the compensation that would recruit from other districts to uh, want to come here. We also uh, did a change on the vesting and how much training they could transfer over. And uh, throughout uh, the growth of the administration, uh, not just the cabinet, but under them, uh, we made it a point that they have sufficient uh, support staff. Uh, there's no question though that uh, to retain them, they need to be happy. And so, uh, going through these hard times, uh, communication and uh, with them and having good leaders, their principals at their school sites uh, in leadership will make a difference. Uh, it takes uh, the whole uh, board and the uh, cabinet along with everybody twinkling down. Uh, that, I was part of that too. That, that, is, that is time for this question. Thank you so much, Mr. Rosas, for your response. Um, Wrapping up this question, 
uh, I'm not rubbing on this question, two, two more candidates. Uh, Mr. Michael Minix, uh, same question. Um, I do agree with, with the other candidates. Uh, to attract the um, highly uh, qualified teachers, um, I feel that the uh, professional development that we provide our staff in the Austin Elementary School District is outstanding. The uh, trainers, the lead teachers, the reading and math coaches in which we have at our school sites, our school administrators, we have outstanding principals. Uh, I think that the training is outstanding in this district. Uh, we don't have to go out to other districts, to other counties, to bring someone in from back east to uh, provide training for our uh, teachers. We have the trainers in the El Centro Elementary School District. We have the support service and they are doing an outstanding job. I do want to say that the El Centro Elementary School District, we lead the way in Imperial County. But when it comes to professional development, we are the leaders. We are the pioneers. We have the support services that, are, that will help keep our highly qualified teachers in the El Centro Elementary School District. Thank you. Um, I will restate the question. Uh, the question is, how will we re retain, excuse me, hold up. Yeah, recruit, recruit and retain, as in to keep, not retrain. But I, I, at the end of the day, I appreciate re your response. It is, it is still very much on topic. Um, Mr. Arevalo, uh, if you would like to wrap up this question, in a minute and 30 seconds. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we have to have a long-term talent system to ensure our teachers have a voice. And more importantly, that that voice is being heard. I want to make sure our teachers don't feel micromanaged or burdened by the additional workload that comes with distance learning. Um, Senate Bill 98 creates a lot of additional stressors for teachers in particular. And I want to make sure that there's a system in place that supports these teachers so that they receive the help they need to be successful. If a teacher is asking for support, there's a good chance I can personally support the teacher as a current board member, as a current teacher, as a current uh, IBQ board member. Um, my position with the IBQ is the director of innovation where I help lead training for our teachers across our local county. In fact, during the summer, I had over 200 local teachers attend one of my sessions on getting ready for distance learning. At the same time, I didn't just implement policy for distance learning with my district, I helped write the policy for my district. You know, I wrote the policy, adhering to all the guidelines, listening to all of the teachers, right? Because at the end of the day, happy teachers equals happy students and happy families. And that's what we need to ensure that our, our teachers stay and that they feel like they have a home here in our Central Elementary School District. Thank you, Mr. Arevalo. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap this whole thing up with closing statements. I'd like to thank everybody for such fluid responses in the question and answer section. Uh, very fluid discussion from all candidates. Uh, we're gonna start the closing statements with three minutes and we're gonna start with candidate Ms. Francis Terrazas. Let me get the timer, one sec. All right, whenever you're ready. Yes. Hello, uh, I am uh, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity of being able to be part of this forum. I really appreciate uh, the coordination and the profession, professionalism involved in the process. I uh, do also uh, thank uh, the other candidates uh, for their participation and their uh, respectfulness during the uh, process also. Um, I am uh, uh, a candidate that is putting the education first, putting the student, uh, but also in a realist, even though I know the importance of what the parents' uh, uh, involvement and importance uh, in the involvement of the process, uh, I do know that the teachers uh, need the support. And uh, even though they uh, 
do have a systemic uh, manner of uh, providing them their professional development, uh, they also need to have a sense of belonging, which is the portion that the uh, uh, principals and the uh, school uh, leaders, such as uh, coaches, uh, assist. I, I want you to remember that you have three votes for the board members. I am one of the three that I would, I'm asking you for the vote to vote for me uh, and the other uh, two candidates of your choice. Uh, I do have uh, not just the heart and the energy to continue, but I also uh, have been keeping updated on all the needed, all the new uh, regulations and uh, what is going on in terms of uh, safety, not just from the health department, but from the school. I am aware of the plan writing uh, and in the school where I work uh, at Broadly High as a school psychologist, uh, we uh, participated, we were still part of it. And uh, it's not just one plan that's approved, uh, but it's a plan that is fluid and it's continuing to uh, go forward uh, to be able to help and definitely uh, uh, involves uh, ju not just one parent or, or uh, one teacher, it involves the whole community. So this is what we are as board members. We're our community and uh, members and representatives and also policy makers. Thank you very much and I hope uh, to get your vote uh, but don't forget to vote on our November 3rd election. Thank you, Mr. Rastas. That wraps up your three minutes. Um, Mr. Chuck Fisher, you're up next for your closing statement. Well, right now we're facing an unprecedented time in education. We're facing learning loss for all students, especially our at-risk foster and English language learners. We're facing safety issues for our students I believe my background and my previous work on the school board will address some, if not all of these issues. As a board member, we have prioritized safety for both our students and staff. Drive by any school and see the changes, new traffic flows, additional fencing, redesigned front office space. This has been a priority and will continue. Our students suddenly went home in mid-March. We're starting the school year with distance learning. Eventually things will normalize and we need a plan to recover some of the lost learning that took place. My experience with both remedial and enrichment programs will be valuable in planning additional programs and resources to mitigate that learning loss. I've been involved with the El Centro Elementary School District as a student, a parent, a classified employee, a teacher, an administrator, and now a board member. I believe my vast knowledge experience and dedication qualifies me to be an excellent trustee for the citizens, the students, and the staff of the El Centro Elementary School District. So I hope you will vote for me on November 3rd. Actually, I hope you vote for me before November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. You still have a minute and 30. Would you like to say anything else? You're good? Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on to Mr. Michael Minix's closing statement. My experience consists of, again, I was a classroom teacher for 19 years. I was a school principal for 16 years, a school board member for nine years. My passion and love for learning is what drove me to run for the school board nine years ago. I didn't have a personal agenda. I cared about students and I cared about our parents and I cared about our families. And because of my love for kids and for learning, I wanted to help make a difference in the El Centro Elementary School District. That's why I am running to retain my seat on the Board of Trustees of the El Centro Elementary School District and serve our students, serve our families, and serve our parents. Again, I say, and I stated this, I supported the Bond Initiative to build a school because I felt that it was important. And not only that, but it was important to the families that live in that community. Because of my commitment 
and my dedication. Because of my leadership, I have a proven record in the El Centro Elementary School District. After 44 years of serving this community, I have a proven record. My experience speaks for itself. My community involvement speaks for itself. The love I have for this district, our families, our parents, and our students and staff speaks for itself. I love the Elson Elementary School District, and that's why I'm passionate about running to retain my seat. And remember, well, when you vote, vote Michael Minnix, El Centro Elementary School Board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minnix. Uh, we're gonna move on to Ms. Patty Dunham's closing statement. Hi, I'm, um... I was born Patricia Wilson Denham, and everybody calls me Patty. I went to the El Central School District schools. I was born and raised, and I then taught in El Central School District for 36 years. I also uh, have my son and my granddaughter and my um, grandson went to the El Central School District. So El Central School District is very dear to my heart. And after having um, all the um, joys and, and thrills of, of seeing my, my son and my grandchildren uh, complete the um, El Central School schools, I always had a desire to, to uh, be a teacher. So I went on and um, was a teacher for 36 years. And during that time, I helped um, lots of kids. I still have students that I see. And I also, um, not only in the school district, I was also a um, busy person in my church. I am a children's pastor, so that is my desire to, to work with kids in all areas. I have worked with the um, American Cancer Society with the children's activities. So my whole life is dedicated and I am passionate to see the best for students. And as a school board member, I have enjoyed my time. I am available. I am at the schools when I need to be there. Along with even uh, being on the school board, I never left the classroom. I substitute. I substitute in Imperial and Hopeville and areas that need me. A lot of times since I am a, um, a school teacher, I can, I can take over for a classroom for um, a long, time period where um, a teacher has to be out. And so what I like to do that is because I keep up with the, uh, the curriculum that is being used now. So even though I'm a board member and retired, I am still in the classroom, I see what the teachers are having to use and their opportunities and the things that they have available for them. And it helps me to have the insight of what maybe our teachers need. And our district has gone overboard we have given our teachers everything that they need, even during this uh, pandemic. And also, we're very passionate to meet their needs, to do the best for students. And remember, my, my theme and my motto is kids first. That's why we have school. And whatever we can do, we plan, we uh, investigate, uh, we see what the teachers need. We have uh, an office um, and, and a school um, that is time for board that, that cares about it. And our decisions are made. What can we do better to make El Central School District the absolute best? And I would appreciate your vote, Patricia Denham, Patty Denham, on November 3rd for El Central Elementary School Board. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Denham, for your closing statement. We're going to wrap up this debate with a closing statement from Mr. Andrew Arevalo. Thank you, uh, first and foremost, to the Imperial Valley Social Justice Committee for hosting and the work you are currently doing in our community. Uh, COVID-19 has accelerated the use of educational technology, drastically altering 21st century education as we know it. Parents, teachers, and students are overwhelmed 
they're under-supported, and many feel like they've been left behind. I'll make sure our stakeholders are provided with sustained professional development in order to support and increase fluency in educational technology for the years to come. At the same time, our current reality is that 67% of our Central Elementary students are failing to meet the basic standard for math comprehension, and 80% are failing to meet the basic standard for science comprehension. Now add in the learning loss due to COVID-19. I'll bridge this dismal gap by ensuring our students, families, and teachers are heard, that they're advocated for, and supported with access to high quality professional development in STEM or creating more classroom opportunities for hands-on project-based learning activities. Students are entering our local workforce and community without having a basic understanding of how to save a dollar, avoid consumer debt, or manage their personal finances. I'll introduce a district-wide curriculum to help develop financial literacy in order to give students a greater chance to compete globally and or to create businesses locally. When I think of the possibility of serving on the Board of Trustees for our Central Elementary School District, I envision a future brimming with hope, opportunity, and access. We can reimagine education today to transform our community tomorrow. However, we are living in uncertain times, and that's exactly why we deserve proven leadership from individuals who are fluent in 21st century education, who are currently practicing and who are fully empathetic of the reality that our community is facing because they are living it as well with their own students. In this election, our community will have the opportunity to select a current practicing elementary educator to lead educational decisions that have long lasting implications in our community. I will advocate for our students, I will advocate for our families, and I will advocate for teachers because I know exactly what they are facing. I look forward to serving our Central Elementary School District and having a greater impact on our community at large. I humbly ask for your support on November 3rd. Please vote Andrew Arevalo for our Central Elementary School District. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arevalo, for your closing statements. Thank you to all the candidates again for a very vivid conversation on the school politics and the school policy that is going on at El Centro Elementary School District that, are, that will impact future generations. At this point, um, we will conclude this segment of the debate forum, and I believe we are going to reconvene at noon for the El Centro City Council uh, forum. Thank you so much uh, to all the candidates for your participation. Have a nice day. All righty, thank you, Raul. So uh, before we begin with the El, City, El Central City Council, I'd like to highlight our sponsors and great helpers. I know um, we have the Social Justice Committee um, with Gretchen Lau and Marlene Thomas. And, and we also have Mark Wheeler from SDSU. He's the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. And of course we have Lawson from SDSU who is um, also, he's a, one of our moderators. So I'd just like to thank everybody um, who's been a great help and you know, getting this candidate forum to be a thing. All right, so let's see. So for our South Central City Council, we have six candidates who are currently running for the, um, for the positions, uh, and four are currently with us who have filled out the questionnaire. Okay, and so if we could possibly pull up, um, we have Sonia Carter, Martha Cardenas Singh, Jason Jackson, and Sylvia Maroquin. I know we just wait for them to be pulled forward to the screen. We're waiting on Mr. Jackson. Okay. Okay, so we'll go in that order and then we'll, um, hopefully we can get a hold of uh, Mr. Jackson soon. Okay. So we're gonna start off with our opening statements. Do we have, let's see. More, yeah, okay, we got all three currently right here for now. And um, could we, uh, could you and guys turn on your, um, Unmute yourselves and turn on your cameras, possibly? Or do they have that ability? Everyone hmm. should have that ability. Hi, this is Hello. Sonia Carter. Hello, Sonia. Hello. Hi. <laughs> 
Now we just need we're just looking for Martha Karna Singh and Sylvia Maroquin to turn on their things. All right, perfect. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining with us. Thank you. Let's see. Now, Sylvia, we having any technical difficulties? I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties with my camera, so give me just a second. Oh, yeah, no problem, Sylvia. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Jackson like has arrived. Yeah, Jason Jackson has just joined. There's... Yes, I'm sorry, I did not see the email last night, so I just got a phone call. No problem at all, as long as we're here now. <laughs> Righty. Mm -hmm. I may have to join on my phone. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on my um, desktop and it's just the camera is just not working. So. Okay. Ms. Well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely um, um, hold on for you as well. If you wanted to switch over to your um, cellular yeah, device. I've been watching, I've been watching the, the candidates and I apologize, but I'm in the same situation. I'm, I'm on my phone right now, um, and I'm not where I have a computer and my video is not working because of the area I'm in. Johnny, we can proceed with uh, audio for two of the four. Okay, yeah, we can definitely, um, we can still continue with your audio for now, Jason, uh, Jason Jackson. And then for Sylvia, I believe she's going to join back on her phone. Okay, so we, um, why don't we start off our opening today? I'm sorry. So let's start off with some opening statements for, um, and we'll start off uh, with um, Sonia Carter, if you'd like to go first. And then uh, just to clarify, we also, it's also the three minute opening statement and then we'll get uh, some time for some questions. And... Hi, it's still morning. So good morning, people. I want to first, um, thank the social justice for this opportunity and everybody who is involved. I want to start by saying my name is Sonia Carter and I'm running for El Central City Council. I have been born and raised right here in El Central, California, and I look forward to serving our community. I have been involved with our community for several years, helping out and um, approaching different people in different areas as far as the North, the South, the East and the West, helping everybody and listening to our people and seeing what they need as a community. As being involved with the community, I have learned different experiences that a lot of people's voices are not being heard. A lot of people that have different opinions, they're, they're being overlooked. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to run because I feel like I have a voice that can be there for the people. And I feel like I can be committed to the people as far as listening and being that backbone and helping them and helping our community get to another level that we need to get to. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I see that. And I have been participating as well as some of the other candidates and getting um, our voices and our names out there as far as seeing what our community needs. And we look forward to seeing what this outcome will be so that way we can press forward. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, did you, you had, um, Oh, you, uh, you had um, a one minute and 20 seconds left. Did you still want to add that? Let's oh, yeah, uh, you can continue on. I just don't have the clock on me because I couldn't uh -huh. get it on my laptop and I, I have the timer on my laptop so I could see it on my phone. So then I got <laughs> it on my phone. So I do apologize for the technical no. difficulties, but I did want to be here and be involved. No, yeah, definitely no problem at all. But yes, um, I I'm, will be honored to seek out to our community and see what our community needs. Making change is something that we need to do. We need to invite, include, and, and include our community voice. City Council is responsible for maintaining the trust of the community. And as far as my background, I come from a family of educators who have worked, worked, worked very hard to get where they were at and to proceed and help other people. So. I feel that I have a strong um, connection with the community and in order for the community to um, succeed and the goals to be changed and reached, 
I feel like the dialogue can be changed to the way that we can work it as a city council, whoever is elected, and hopefully that will be me. Thank you. Uh, awesome, thank you. thank you. All right, and so um, we, we have an opening statement. We could, so we could go send it off to Martha Cardenas, if you'd like. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So excited to be here with you today. I really appreciate this opportunity and this space to be able to share my thoughts and my vision for the city of El Centro. Um, just to share a little bit about who I am. I am a third generation El Centro resident. My children are fourth generation. And what I'm most proud of is that my grandchildren are going to be a fifth generation of the future of the city of El Centro. I seek to serve you on the city council. I have witnessed its history with all of its, all of its successes. I view the city of El Centro and its resources as an opportunity to promote public health, affordable housing, and pathways to higher education and employment. My leadership style is to solve problems through respectful and collaborative efforts. In the midst of this pandemic, I offer proven leadership, innovation, and a commitment to our community. If elected, we will take immediate action to improve unemployment and underemployment rates, economic development, the homelessness crisis that we are experiencing, and access to healthcare services. City government needs to be transparent and inclusive. I'm recognized throughout the community for my passionate activism and my investment in our youth. As the assistant director at the University of California, San Diego, I oversee the California Student Opportunities and Access Program. I have the opportunity to encourage all students to have access to a higher education or a career pathway. My focus is to work with low-income first-generation students in trying to achieve that college dream. I've had the opportunity to work with students and to be a strong community advocate. I have nurtured a deep commitment to social, environmental, and economic justice. I proudly serve as the president of Mana de Imperial Valley. I am the treasurer of ARC Imperial. Uh, uh, Imperial. I have um, also served as vice president of Seroptimus International of El Centro. And I um, also serve as treasurer for Vaux Neighborhood Medical. The past five years, I have been an advocate in providing information, education, and uh, direction in regards to bringing awareness on human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of children. Uh, I offer my values, experience, commitment in keeping the momentum of progress for the residents of El Centro. I am ready to listen, serve, and lead. All right, Martha, and that was time as well. And, but thank you, thank you so much for your opening statement. All right, All right thank you, Martha. Okay, and uh, Sylvia, we see you got um, your cell phone, or is this the desktop? Um, uh, when you're ready, you, um, or, okay, we got it, oh, perfect. So when you're ready, you can give us your opening statement and I'll time it for three minutes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sylvia Marroquin. I am a lifelong resident of El Centro. I am running to become a member of the El Centro City Council because service to my community is extremely important to me. Um, I want to contribute to the ongoing progress of our city. And, you know, I know that there has been many, pro well, progress has has been happening all along, but I know that it's needed and it, we must continue the work that the current city council has done. And, um, but you know, we also need new ideas. So um, I attended all local elementary schools. I graduated from Central Union High School. I completed my um, higher education here in Imperial Valley as well. So I am a business professional with more than 25 years of experience as a banking executive, five years of experience as a certified business advisor for small business owners, and four years of experience as a business manager for a local private school. Through these positions, I have been responsible for development and oversight of mission-driven programs 
annual budgets, human resources, bookkeeping, accounts payable, and maintenance of facilities. I believe the work experience I have gained throughout my career, coupled with my Master of Business Administration degree, have prepared me to lead the city of El Centro through the challenging times and issues that lie ahead. Um, service, again, as I want to reiterate that service to my community is, is extremely important to me. Um, I volunteer for my local um, parish community. Um, as, a, as a volunteer, I operate and manage to um, give stores for both Catholic parishes here in El Centro. And um, let me tell you that that is another full-time job. So, but because of this pandemic, unfortunately, we've been closed. So now we're hopefully getting, you know, back into um, our somewhat normal routine. I, I've also participated as a member of the Optimist Club of El Centro. I am past president and, and a board member of the Optimist Club of El Centro. And um, I believe that running for city council is my civic duty. And it fulfills my mission of giving back to our community. And um, that is the reason why I am running. It's, it's, you know, service is extremely important to me. And, and um, you know, I just want to give it my all, my heart, and my life is here in El Centro. I love my community, and that's why I am running for a seat on the city council. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. All right. And that was just, that was perfect timing. Okay, so let's see. And also before I, uh, I move on to Jason Jackson, I'd like to say that there's also the, I like to point out again that we also have the Q&A box right there in case anyone wants to ask a question for our uh, potential city council. And it's, okay, so now um, do we have um, Jason Jackson on? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Right, good. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And I apologize having a uh, uh, getting the late notice and didn't didn't uh, have my my video with me today, but um, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Jason Jackson. I have been on the city council for nine years um, and serving uh, the city. I uh, was mayor in 2016. I'm currently the mayor pro tem. Uh, before that, I served four years on the El Centro Planning Commission. Uh, so I have 13 years of serving the city and the residents of El Centro. I'm very involved with extracurricular uh, charitable organizations such as Kiwanis and Rotary. Um, I am co-founder of the Imperial Valley Patriotic Planning Committee uh, here in Imperial County. I'm very involved with the veterans. Um, I have, um, I was uh, instrumental along with my colleagues in getting the Veterans Memorial um, built at Buckland Park, which is something that I'm very proud of. And, uh, you know, just a little bit about the city where, you know, the city's in, in a good place. Um, uh, a lot of cities would love to be in the position that El Centro is in right now. Uh, we've, uh, we have a very good leadership core. We've got great staff. We've made tremendous strides. Uh, the success of Measure P and the passage of Measure P, that half cent sales tax in 2016, is, has been instrumental in us uh, really... Uh, addressing our park needs. Um, I'm sure if you've been around the city of El Centro, uh, everybody has recognized the uh, tremendous rehabilitation of, of our existing parks. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed and built two brand new parks in Plank Park and First Responders Park. Um, just the attention to our youth movement with uh, the Aquatic Center and the Skate Park and really uh, transforming the area around Adams Avenue uh, and the corridor for city of El Centro. So we've been very instrumental in, in addressing those needs. Um, I want to say that I've been, you know, relatively involved with the social justice uh, movement here in Imperial County. I'm um, proud to say that I, I attend just about every uh, function that has been put on. Uh, I've been honored to speak at several of those events and um, I can also say that many times I'm the, you know, the only or one of the only elected officials that, that shows up to all these events. I, I think it's important uh, when you're elected to serve a community, you're elected to serve every part of that community. And so um, having accessibility and, and having the people in different organizations and different, uh, with different thoughts and different uh, ideas to have access to a city council member and bring those ideas forth, I think is very important. And that's why I, I make sure that I'm accessible to uh, your membership as 
well as the membership of every organization that's out there that wants to make El Centro a better place. All right, Mr. Jackson, that was perfect timing. All right, well, thank you for your state opening statement, as well as all the candidates for your opening statements. Um, I'd like to give the mic to Marlene. Marlene, are you still present with us? Let's see. Not at the moment, after you complete city council. Oh, definitely, okay, of course. All right, so we're gonna get to our questionnaire um, portion of the segment. And let's see, we're gonna start off with um, Mr. Jason Jackson. And with our first question, let's see here. All right. So this will be starting off with Jason Jackson. Okay. And, the, and the question will be, um, with the funding our city receives, how can you ensure that those funds will go to helping community residents? Well, I think, you know, let me be very clear that, that the current city council, along with myself, are very cognizant of, of the needs of El Centro. And every time we have opportunities, whether they be grant funding or um, any type of opportunities for funding, whether it's state and federal, local funds, um, we, we meet about what are the needs of El Centro, whether it be addressing uh, public works issues, um, whether it be affordable housing, which is something that we just, you know, got a couple of grants for, and we're going to be adding to our inventory of affordable housing, which is very important to save our Centro and their residents. Um, but we, we, we don't just we just go about our business and just pour money into different things without seeing what the actual needs are. So we, um, we have a task force that's made up of our community services task force, which is made up of myself, and uh, Ms. Walker uh, and all of our department heads, our city manager. And we meet on a monthly, uh, sometimes bi-monthly right now during COVID. And we really go over what those needs are. Um, you know, one of the big things that we, we focused on a couple of years ago was uh, the literacy rates of uh, residents of El Centro and Imperial County uh, are extremely high. And so uh, moving forward with a brand new library and with the new technology and really making a library accessible to our community was something that we deemed important because of the literacy uh, rates. So, you know, we're, we're very proud with uh, the funding that we received from Measure P that we'll be breaking ground on a brand new library uh, first quarter of, of 2021. So these are things that uh, we are uh, uh, focused on. We're focused on um, obviously education. We're focused on our youth. Um, you see a lot of our rehabilitating of, of parks and bringing those those fields up to par where a lot of times, you know, in the past you had people say, why can't our parks be like what you see in San Diego or Palm Desert? Um, and I think today, if you drive around, you look at our parks, I mean, they are the greenest they've been in, in years that we have brand new uh, equipment. I mean, we've really addressed the needs of our residents and, and especially now with COVID, you know, people are really utilizing their our parks for recreation and, and trying to get that you know, get out of the house and get some fresh air type thing. So it's very important that we've addressed those needs. But yeah, anytime we get funding, uh, we always look at what is the best for our community. Uh, we, we recently got some CARES Act money um, and we looked at how do we use that money to best suit our city. One of the examples of that is, is that we're trying to help our, our local business uh, community, but we're also trying to keep people safe. We chose to take some of that money and buy thermometers to give to our business community, no charge. Mr. So Jackson, that'll be it for uh, two minutes. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't know there was a time. No, no, it's all good. Yeah, no problem. All right, thank you, Mr. Jackson. All right, and now we'll be, um, the same issue, I mean, the same question will be going to each um, of the candidates. So um, I'm gonna repeat the question just to make sure I, I made it uh, clear. Let's see, so it's, um, how will you ensure our community can be uplifted? Oh, you know, with the funding our community receives, how can you ensure that those funds will go to helping our community residents? And then I'll oh, we will be passing it to uh, uh, Ms. Sylvia. Well, you know, first of all, I would assess the needs of the community. And um, you know, during this pandemic, the uh, priorities, you know, there are priorities that have become of higher importance than, you know, some of the other basic needs here within the city. 
you know, I think that one of our uh, most important priorities is getting the business community up and, and operating. And um, I know that, you know, the city recently received um, a half a million dollar grant to help business owners with a loan program. Now, I know that um, this loan program is, is a little restrictive because of the, um, the source that the, the funds came from and their guidelines and restrictions on the monies, you know, but one of the things that, that uh, we, well, that I would do is, is reach out to the business community to inform them that there is help available and also partner with other resource agencies such as the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, you know, to assist these because I reviewed the application process and it's, it's overwhelming. And, um, you know, a small business owner doesn't have the time because they're operating their business to uh, complete a, a, an application that requires so much backup documentation. So that's where I would, you know, focus my attention because, you know, the small business owners, you know, they generate income not only for themselves, but for the city as well, and they employ people. And so we need to start reducing the unemployment rate here in, in the Valley and have some of these business owners rehire. So I know that there's another program that um, comes through the community development block grant. Um, and so, you know, the, the business owners have options. So the other, um, the other priority here is, is if, if we have funding and we can, you know, effectively use it, then I would also look at resources to uh, alleviate the homelessness in El Central because, you know, that, that is, um, it, it's not just a, an issue in our city, it's an issue throughout the county, it's an issue throughout the nation. And, it, you know, we need to find uh, ways to be able to, to house these people, um, whether it be a shelter, or whether it be, you know, some some little unit, you know, that we can provide, um, you know, just a, a bed for them, um, food on, on their table, and a place to shower, you know, so that that is how I would prioritize, you know, funding, you know, for the city, and then look at the other basic needs of, of our residents here in El Centro. Ms. Sylvia, uh, that was time as well. Okay. But thank you so much for your response. Thank you. Of course. All right. And uh, Martha, did you need us to repeat that question as well? Yes, please. Just to yes. do that. Yeah, of course. It's going to be um, with the funding our city receives, how can you ensure that those funds will go to helping our community residents? I think one of my biggest platform is to be a transformational leader. And what I mean by that is that I would make sure that we had um, town hall meetings, if you will, even if it was virtually, that we would do a community needs assessment. We can't be planning for business owners if we're not willing to hear their voice. So I would make sure that we had stakeholder meetings in which we had that opportunity to hear their struggles, um, their recommendations, and what some of their concerns are. It's hard to build around something without having the input from the individual that is experiencing those issues. Um, the number one thing that I would take a look at, like I said, is do that collaborative, have town hall meetings, bring in our stakeholders. And I think the most important thing in this as well is to leverage, to leverage state and federal dollars in regard to making sure that we receive additional funding. We are in a very specific situation in regards to us meeting the designation. We are designated by the state as a disadvantaged community. And knowing that we're a disadvantaged community, we can leverage state and federal dollars, which means we are the first in line when it comes to funding because we meet those qualifiers. So um, I would take a look at that classification. I would make sure that we in, brought in money. We understand that there is limitations in regards to the impact of the of our economy in regards to um, bringing in dollars so i would make sure that we do that i also know that we have two programs our cares act and i also took a look at our um, micro enterprise loan program as well so i would bring in the business owners and we would have those discussions likewise with our home the crisis with our homeless population i would make sure that i worked closely um, with our um, imperial valley continuum of care um, council to make sure that we're hearing the impact, the struggles and the obstacles that our homeless population is experiencing. So the message in all this is to make sure that it's a collective voice that the community belongs to its residents and that we're reaching out to our community. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you. All right, and uh, Sonia Carter, Ms. Sonia Carter, you're available. All right, awesome. 
And then did you need me to repeat that question for you? Yes, please. Yeah, definitely. So it's uh, with the funding our city receives, how can you ensure that those funds will go to helping our community residents? I feel like it's time to break the cycle. I feel that it's time to do some proactive intervention. And when, when I, with that being said, it's time to meet with the community, all of the community, go with the business owners, go with the people that, um, there's a lot of people that are working behind the curtains with the homeless, with the less fortunate people that have a lot of insight. They do have a lot of information that they're willing to share, but nobody has been willing to listen. So as far as a shelter goes, I really think that the money should go towards getting um, affordable housing for other people, but as far as a shelter for the less fortunate and the money we need to have to maintain the shelter. That's the biggest issue. A lot of people keep asking, okay, well, if you open a shelter, if you're all for a shelter, how would this um, continue to be affordable? Well, we're going to have to have the money to maintain the shelter. There would have to be money put to the side because as we went and looked downtown and we were uh, walking the downtown area, you can tell that it hasn't been cleaned in a while. Well, the shelter, we want to make sure that the area stays clean. We want to make sure that people um, are keeping it to a respectable level. And then we also want to uh, go with the lack of affordable housing and the employment. I do want to look into that as well because there's a lot of people that are suffering in those areas and there are people that are reaching out and our youth they have a lot of whys a lot of whys and it's been a different levels either you're going with the bottom level or you're going with the top level and they have to remember there is a middle class level as well and i i can say i was fortunate being raised in a two-parent home uh, but i've also seen both sides because i raised my daughter in a single parent home so I know how it feels to be both ways. And our youth is reaching out because there's a lot of parents also that are dealing with the housing committee that want to know what are we going to do for the people that have been divorced and the housing they can't afford it. So there's a lot of questions and there. I've been out with the community and I've been asked a lot of different things and a lot of areas about where the money will be spent. And I feel like we need a dialogue. We need to sit down and we need to, um, have an outline of what we want to do and where we want to go. And this has to come from the people. We need right. to have yeah, their voice. That's also time for the two minutes. Oh, they want to cut you off. All right. No, thank you're you. fine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sonia. Thank you all candidates for your, um, for your nice responses. Let me check to the Q&A. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this question could possibly go um, in course with the other question we had, but it goes on, it goes with, um, what would be your top three priorities if elected? And um, I wanna start off again with Sonia and we can go back in the same direction. And then, so this will be the same question for everyone else. And that is, what are your three priorities uh, upon elect election? Okay, can you see me? Yes there okay yes my three priorities first priority would be the safety um as we looked into the research and found out that two months ago our current city council they just upholded the a, a permit as far as um reaching out to see about things to help people with the COVID 19. well this happened in march so what happened to the four months prior to that that's where I'm at. We need to be on target with things. We need to do things as they happen. So one thing with my first priority will be safety. My second will be the low wages because we need to help out everybody. I'm talking about the North, the South, the East and the West. There's a lot of people that are screaming out because of the low wages. They want help. They wanna know how are we going to live if we can't afford it. Then that leads into my third with the homeless and with the left fortunate and then the, um, the housings it, it all collaborates together so i feel like we have a lot of work to do but that's my my personal opinion as my first three but i do already have a master plan and i've been doing a lot of structuring as far as going out and reaching and writing things out i have a lot of whys i keep a why book because i'm ready to work thank you thank you miss all right and then we can give the question awesome 
go back to Martha Gardena Singh. And, and so that question again will be, what would be your top three priorities if elected? And I'm just double checking, is the time two minutes or three minutes? I'm sorry, just for clarification. Oh, uh, two minutes for the questions. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, of course, the um, emerging issues. My number one emerging issue is public health during this pandemic. As the city of El Centro, we hold the county seat and we own our, our hospital. We should be leading in addressing this pandemic. We need to have access to COVID testing, rapid results, and we also need to have wraparound services in regards to COVID. We need to make sure that our citizens have the basic needs that are being met, their shelter, food, and emotional support. In, in regards to that, we wanna make sure they have access to healthcare, they have financial support, and that we're able to help them on their recovery, to help them with childcare, uh, maybe their utilities, and maybe quarantine housing. I'm not saying that the city of El Central will have to pay for that, but what I am saying is that we should be facilitating those conversations to help our citizens as they're experiencing this pandemic. My number two emerging issue would be economic recovery. Business community engagement is a must. We could do this through our El Centro Chamber of Commerce. We could work with a business COVID task force. We could have stakeholder meetings. And in addition to that, we can have sister city agreements with the Coachella Valley and Mexicali Valley area so that we can bring commerce. We can bring people to purchase, buy here, and eat here. So economic stimulus is a must. My third issue would then be um, taking a look at making sure that we revitalize the downtown area. I was disheartened, I was frustrated, and I was saddened to see how the downtown area has been deep, deep. It is just it neglected. It is in severe neglect there appears to be even a public health issue in regards to what it looks like down there. And there appears to be no action and no plan for the downtown area. Okay, Martha, that was perfect on time. Thank you. All right, and Sylvia, um, we're passing it over to you. The question, did you need all me to repeat that question one more time? Um, yes, please. Yeah, definitely. So it's, um, so uh, as um, if elected, what would be your top three priorities? Well, I'd like to start off with care for the health of our community is one of our uh, top priorities or one of my top priorities. And what I mean by that is we must maintain a strong hospital system. You know, since the city owns the hospital, it's important that, you know, that they're able to provide all the services that the community needs in this, this time of, of a crisis, you know, with this pandemic, you know, but aside from that, what I also mean is the, the, um, the health of the hospital, what I mean is the financial health of the hospital. And so, you know, I reached out to the CEO at the hospital and, you know, he shared with me that even though they're receiving funding from the federal government, that that funding will have to be repaid. And so, you know, unfortunately, you know, that means that um, many projects and many other services that the hospital is um, is planning on will have to be will have to take a step back because of the, the financial deficits that they're going to face within the next um, three to five years. Um, another uh, priority of mine is mitigating the economic uh, fallout due to COVID-19 by assisting the small business community. And, um, you know, like Martha said, you know, we, we walked the downtown area together. This has been an area that is, is a concern. It's been a concern for quite a while. You know, it's just like, and, um, you know, we've seen we have not seen any improvements to the downtown area. And, you know, so we would then have to, you know, reach out to the, you know, the, the city would have, excuse me, let me restart that. What I'm thinking is that, um, you know, the city must take a, a position where, where we should, um, it, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm so passionate about that, but, um, enact the, the uh, ordinances, you know, to those absentee landlords because they are the ones that are creating the, um, the disparity that is in the downtown area, okay? And so that means that, you know, if, if we have to then impose fees on them, that's what the city must do to get them to refurbish those buildings. 
Um, another um, area of my great concern, again, and I repeat this, is the homelessness here in, in our community and throughout the Imperial County. You know, it's just like, even though there's a county agency that provides resources, but the city is, um, is not providing, as, I think, as many resources as, as we possibly could. All right, Sylvia, thank you, thank you. Now I it's time. <laughs> I don't know getting ready. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sylvia, thank you. All right, and Jason Jackson, you, um, uh, we have the question of, um, if elected, what would be your top three priorities? Yeah, well, I think, you know, top three priorities are exactly what, what the city has been doing for the last several months is obviously COVID is, is our priority, whether it's the health and safety of our residents or it is the uh, bringing back our local economy and help. Mr. Jackson, I think we might have cut off right there. Are you still with us? Jason, did I hear, did I hear you a little bit? I can, hear, can you hear me? Okay, now, now we're getting a connection again. Yeah, are you still there? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not in the greatest set of areas. Um, what part did you, what was the last thing you heard? I'm sorry, before I cut out. We were going with the uh, top three priorities and you said COVID was one. Oh, okay, so you, okay, so I was in for a while. Okay, so um, the top three as far as, they're all gonna be linked to COVID related issues. Um, and this city, the Perp Council has, has made it a priority to address the health and safety of our citizens, uh, the local economy and our business community and getting people back to work. Um, so, you know, I guess one thing, one advantage I have of being on the council um, over, over my uh, the candidates that are also on, on today is that I, I'm on the inside and I see what, we, what we've done. And we've really been the, the leader of Imperial County when it comes to addressing uh, COVID and COVID related issues. Um, we we had COVID meetings, you know, special meetings every Friday just to address what was going on and giving our community and our residents uh, that information, that education on how to be safe, um, what to do. We had the CEO and, and doctors from the hospital coming in every week and really just trying to educate our community to be as safe as possible. Um, we've addressed the local economy. We're working with business owners. Um, I sit with the El Centro Chamber as uh, my position as the mayor pro tem. And I'm hearing every month from business owners. Um, I hear daily from business owners, but we have monthly meetings with the chamber and all their members. So we're very in tune with what's going on with our business community. We're very in tune with what's going on in our hospital and um, our response to the health and welfare of our residents. So I think uh, COVID is gonna be the thing that's gonna drive right, us for several months. Uh, Mr. Jackson, yeah, that'll be it for the two minute mark. Okay. But thank you so much, thank you. Okay, and we're about to be wrapping it up with, uh, we can do one more question for each candidate. And then upon that, we'll be doing our three minute closing statement. So, um, so we can go back to you, Mr. Jackson, about um, uh, to go first. Let's see. So I, I'm gonna go with this question. Of, um, let me take a look to find these good juicy. But it appears, um, Here's there might be a little issue with audio right there too. I'm, I'm hearing you okay. Are you hearing me okay? Oh yeah, no, I got, I got a little right there. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, let's go with the questions right here. And no questions in the Q and A, just make sure. Okay. And so um, this question goes with, um, how have you ensured that the local community has been involved in and connected you know, to your campaign? I'm sorry, can you, can you say that again? Yeah, definitely. It's uh, uh, how have you ensured that the local community has been involved in and connected to your campaign? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, um, very engaged with the community. I'm, I'm very um, blessed to have uh, received the endorsements of, of many organizations throughout uh, Imperial County, uh, the labor unions, the police officer association, the fire association, 
um, yesterday I received the, the full endorsement of the Calpat and Sentinella uh, State Prison Association. And, you know, so all these different stakeholders that make up El Centro, make up the Imperial Valley, I, I'm very engaged with all of them. And I think one of the reasons that I've, I've received so many endorsements and so much support from uh, local leaders, uh, current and past um, elected officials, as well as all these different organizations is my accessibility, um, my engagement with their organizations, my involvement with those organizations. Um, I'm very much a community-minded person. I'm, I'm not uh, community-minded just you know six months before an election. I'm community-minded always. And I've spent my life dedicated to community service and giving back to my community. It goes all the way back to when I was a Boy Scout and became an Eagle Scout. And that, that was really what brought me up. My parents, uh, you know, showing me what it is to be fortunate and to give back to our community. And I've been very blessed. Um, this community has given me so much and uh, I will continue to give back to my community. So I think the engagement is, is just natural, uh, just the way that uh, I engage with our, our stakeholders and have always an open, uh, kind of an open door policy. Um, I've publicize my, my cell phone number on everything. Uh, I receive phone calls and text messages, you know, daily from my community members. And, and I'm just very out there. I'm very out in the community. And, and I just, I really enjoy that part of being on the city council. Uh, unfortunately, this campaign is, is a little different because of the restrictions of COVID, but I very much enjoy campaigning and just being out and talking to people. So I think that's the, the biggest part of engaging with our community. All right, Jason, thank you, thank you. With time right there as well. Thank you for your answer. All righty, and let's take a look. Okay, so Ms. Maracuyan, um, we can, uh, let me say that question one more time. And so um, the question was, how have you ensured that the local community has been involved in and connected to your campaign? Well, you know, campaigning for a political office during a pandemic has certainly presented many challenges. Um, you know, it, and especially with outreach to our community. And, um, you know, because we want to ensure that we maintain, um, you know, a safe distance for ourselves as well as our constituents. And so, it, you know, this is, this is where I can, I have done um, outreach in, in other forms, okay? Um, and I know that I can't do this alone. So I have engaged the help of some of um, my supporters who are committed to speaking with uh, community members and gathering insight on the issues that we are um, living, you know, that's the second that are affecting our lives and what solutions they want to see. Okay, so, you know, what I've, what I've done is, you know, it, in a mass, you know, mailing, I've, I've um, you know, addressed, you know, my priorities to my constituents. And, um, you know, this is how I, I've conveyed my message to them. So um, other things that, that I have done is um, I plan to engage the broader community in my campaign with, with social media posts, you know, because it's important that I convey the message, you know, not just by, not in a written message, but also, um, you know, actually telling, you know, my constituents what, what I plan and, you know, what, what my vision is for the city of El Centro. So, and, and that is why, you know, um, running for, for this seat, you know, has, has been, you know, an extreme, you know, challenge on, on not just my part, I'm sure the other candidates are facing, you know, the same, um, you know, challenges. So if I'm elected, then I'm committed to being engaged in dialogue with Dell Central residents, you know, to better understand what their concerns are, what their issues are, and to address th those concerns and issues. Um, I would then participate in continuous active learning through meetings with constituents, um, you know, attending events, you know, to ensure that I am there and I'm present and I am available, you know, for them to reach out to me and, and talk right, to me Mark about Quinn. these things together. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you so but we, we did hit our two minute mark. Well, that, that, thank you for your answer. All right. And we're gonna get, um, get the spotlight to Martha. And, um, and the question here is, um, how have you ensured that your local community has been involved in and connected to your campaign? Wonderful. I also saw a quick message from Dr. Wheeler. So he had asked for us to go ahead and introduce our names again. So Martha Cardenas Singh, 
Um, the answer to that is, th this is probably my favorite question in regards to making sure that I'm connected to my community. I hold several leadership positions on community-based organizations, and so I really get to have the um, opportunity to amplify the voice and the concerns from the individuals that I'm working with. And I'll tell you, one of those top priorities was my connection with Dr. Vo. Um, he started, he actually started a meals to heal program. And one of the biggest concerns we saw with COVID is that if an individual um, did contract the COVID, um, contract, contract COVID, we realized that they didn't have maybe a support system at home because they had to isolate at home. So when we talk about taking a need a needs assessment and really taking a look at what our community needs. It means you need to roll up your sleeves and you need to make sure that you're hearing from the community. So we saw that it was urgent. It was imperative that we provided a support system for individuals who had COVID. I also, as president of MANA, the Imperial Valley, on our board, we have several women in leadership positions who shared the inside track in regards to the frustrations, the crisis, and the situations that um, individuals were experiencing both at a departmental level and on a daily level or as an employee. So we were able to hear those concerns. Um, in addition to that, I'm an educator, which I, I, I'm very proud of. And so in doing so, I get to hear all the, in, all the struggles that students are dealing with, teachers are dealing with in regards to distance learning. I also have the opportunity to hear um, what's happening on the higher education level and what my employees are experiencing also with the impact of COVID. So I've had that opportunity to hear the voice of our community. Awesome, thank you, Martha. All right, and um, uh, Sonia, Ms. Uh, Carter, are you, uh, we have the question of how have, um, how have you ensured that your local community has been involved in and connected to your campaign? Well, having the respect of the community is, is, a, is a definite plus sign. Through social media, just um, getting your, this, with the pandemic going on, it's been hard, but it's also been reaching out to people through social media. And social media, I say with Facebook, with Snapchat, with Instagram, and, and I really appreciate the youth because with my um, experience of working with the school district for 22 years, I have the experience of working with the youth and I have them to show me different things and tell me different things and how to run that path. So reaching out with the youth and the different community and as far as the parents and, and getting to know the people, I have that background. I want to understand our people more though. I want to attend events and I want to support the community. I will listen and I will be that leader that our, our people deserve. But as far as being out there, I just basically been myself. And that, that's enough because I feel like if I can just be me and reach out to the community and just reach out to the people because of being born and raised in the Valley, our name is well known and we do know a lot of people. And, um, I deserve a chance to show you that my experience is proactive to the community. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. All right, now with this, we'll officially be wrapping up the Al Centro um, Council um, portion. And um, I'd like uh, Ms. Sonia Carter, if you could come back, but to um, close off with your three minute um, closing statement. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I first want to close out by um, I just have to give uh, first respect where respect goes. If it wasn't for my for God, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Being born and raised in the church and being a youth director for 12 years, I definitely have to give credit where credit is due. And if there's anything I want our people to take from this, I want um, them to know that I'm here to listen to the people. Most people do not listen with intent to understand, they listen with intent to reply. And I say that often because uh, I come from a, a house full of educators and you have to understand people before you can reply. Our community is screaming out from the North, the South, the East and the West. And what they want is for us to provide access. 
they need access to different things. And in order for us to provide access to them, we need to step up and we need to meet more with our people. We need to meet more with the community. We need to meet more with the businesses. We need to go out and meet more with the less fortunate. I, I have the honor, I don't video record everything because I feel like uh, being born and raised in church, that's called blocking your blessing. I go out as a family, we go out and we feed the homeless and we, we do a lot, a lot of things for the less fortunate. And I feel like if we come in, if I come in with the openness of experience and um, I will give you my interest level, I will give an understanding and basic uh, personality of who I am and why I'm here to help the community because people are divided into three categories. Those people who want to make things happen, those people who watch things happen, and those people who wonder what happened. Well, I am the person who wants to make things happen. I feel like if we can make things happen as a community, that would be wonderful. How quickly we um, bypass the achievements of different other people. But I will not, I, I'm commending the people from the city council prior to the things that they have done. And um, I just see change in a lot of areas that I would like to bring change to. I don't want to speak on it because then it seems like your ideas become theirs. So I want to get involved and I want people to know that um, the future holds really big. I see a lot of things happening and not in the four years. I do want to put myself on a, on a time limit of getting things done in at least four months as far as having a time frame of how I want things to work and how things um, should go. So I feel like if you um, have a problem and you want to do anything that considers coming to the community, please come and have a talk with me. Let me know your perspective. I give you my honors and I appreciate everything and I appreciate everybody here today. And I wish everybody the best as far as all of the candidates, candidates as far as in the Imperial Valley. And I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Martha, if you'd like to give us your three minute closing statement as well. Sure, uh, Martha Cardenas Singh. I'm community minded and able to bring regional stakeholders to address regional issues. I have a strong work ethic, respected as a transformational leader and I build trust within my community by listening and addressing unmet needs. I have a heart for the underserved population and building equity for our community. My three priorities again, economic recovery, engagement of state and federal resources to address the injustice related to affordable housing and adequate health care and quality of life amenities. My utmost priority if elected is to address the public health and the economic health of our city. We need to hold state and federal agencies accountable for support when it comes to access to health and medical resources and economic stimulus. We must understand and prioritize public health concerns as to ensure we have a strategic plan in place. As we experience, and we are going to experience, rolling COVID outbreaks. My platform is to be proactive, responsive, and equally as important is the priority to reopen businesses safely by leveraging state and federal monies and resources. As a city council member, my commitment is to support, reopen, recover, and to grow. Um, I think one of my most important platforms for myself is that I'm a supporter of access, inclusion, and equity for all citizens of the city of El Centro. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Martha. Thank you so much, okay. And Sylvia, um, it's back uh, to your closing three minutes. Um, here you go. Okay. Oh, there we go. Well, did I disappear? Um, oh, no, no. Um, we can see. I think you, um, you appeared big on our screen. You're visible. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, you know, I would like to say that um, I currently work for a, a nonprofit. I work for a local private school, but it's it's part of a church community. And you know, working for a nonprofit agency alongside with you know my business mindset, you know, it has really opened my eyes to the health, financial, and employment disparities in our city. 
And so I recognize that the solutions lie in not just a local, but also a regional mindset approach, and that I can bring a valuable voice to the table when, discuss the, when discussing these issues uh, within our city and within the region, because you know we also have to collaborate with our um, county officials and not just the city officials, you know, to get things done within our city. As my awareness of these disparities has grown, I understand that when elected, I will need to work alongside with the other council members and other cities within the county to attract available resources aimed at mitigating disparities within our, our, our town and uh, within the, the city, within the county, and, and so on, okay? Because we're not in, in this alone. Alrighty, I, um, as I had mentioned before, I am a lifelong resident of El Centro. My heart and my life is here. I love my community. And that is the reason why I am running for a public office. You know, it is not easy to do this, okay? It's a challenge. And, you know, sometimes I might not articulate myself as, as well as I would really like to, but, you know, I see a need here. And I think that I can contribute to the needs and you know, it's like, and like what Martha said, you know, I'd like, like to reiterate my priorities. You know, we have to ensure, especially during this pandemic, that we, you know, maintain the, the health, not only of our community, but the health of our hospital. You know, help these, our business, our local business owners, you know, by reaching out to them. Because, you know, believe it or not, I worked for the Small Business Development Center for five years. There were many business owners that did that did not know that we existed, that we were a resource there to help them. And so that's why it would be the responsibility of public officials, you know, to reach out to the community and, and the business owners to let them know that there is help out there and to do our best, you know, to ensure that they get the help that they need. And so, um, you know, one other thing is, is you know, the, the homelessness, you know, I, I can't say enough about that because you know, I believe, and you know, I may be dreaming, but I think, you know, dreamers accomplish things, you know, but, um, you know, a, a shelter is greatly needed here in El Centro. And, uh, you know, maybe even um, a rehab facility, because a lot of these people suffer from different, um, different ailments, you know, that led them to the situation that they're in right now. That was time, but, but thank you so much. Oh, wow, that went <laughs> fast, thank you. <laughs> of course. Okay, now we have uh, Jason Jackson with your closing statement for three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, you know, I want to thank you guys, the um, Real Vice Social Justice Committee, for hosting this and uh, for your questionnaire. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, just let me just say, uh, my name is Jason Jackson to um, reiterate that for uh, Dr. Wheeler, but Jason Jackson, I've been on the city council for nine years, served the city of El Centro for 13, and it's been it's been my honor and my privilege um, to, to serve the residents of El Centro. I'm seeking re-election for four more years because we, we've accomplished so much in the last nine years. Um, if you look back uh, prior to myself being on the council and um, you know, there were so many challenges that El Centro had and we've, we've come together as a council and we've, we've hit those head on. Uh, COVID has certainly thrown us a curveball, uh, no doubt. It's, cur it's thrown all of us a, a curveball, but um, the leadership that we have in this city uh, that I've been a part of for the last nine years has been up to the task. Uh, we have done everything to educate and make our, our community as safe as possible. Uh, we have gone above and beyond in uh, working collaboratively with state, local, and federal officials. Uh, we've engaged different agencies. We've collaborated with different departments and different agencies throughout the county and state to really bring all the resources we can to our residents. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of is, is our city council and, our, and, and the things that we've accomplished. And, you know, the passage of Measure P, the capital improvements that we've been able to do, um, I think there's a lot of, of talk about, you know, different different ideas and different things. And, and that's great. I think that's always great about elections is different ideas are, are tossed around and, and perspectives. And, and I, you know, I, I respect those, those ideas and those um, uh, thoughts, but there's a lot of things that, that we do that 
we don't, uh, I, I think one of the things that we probably don't do very well is we don't pat ourselves on the back uh, as a council. But I have an extreme respect for my colleagues because we don't do that. We don't go out of our way to say how great we are, how, how good we've done something or, or what we've accomplished. We just put our nose down and we get the work done. Um, but, you know, it shows. It shows in the accomplishments that this city has had. It shows in the fact that, you know, during the recession, we were the only city in this county that never furloughed employees, never had to do any layoffs. And, you know, that, that speaks volumes to the leadership. And so I've been part of that leadership team. I'm very proud to say that that uh, I've been part of that team for the last nine years and look forward to four more years of working with my colleagues to get us through this pandemic. And that's certainly going to be first and foremost um, on our minds. And it has been for the last several months. But we will get through this. We are resilient people here in Imperial Valley, and we will come together. And together, we will beat COVID. We will get our economy going again. We'll get our small businesses back uh, open and get our workforce back uh, to the workplace. So. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and and i appreciate the time all right awesome thank you thank you jason um, with that we are finishing off the house central portion but i'd like to thank each one of you candidates for giving us your perspective and what you plan and want to do with our city and for everyone viewing too because it's an educated vote when you're here to watch and see exactly what you're voting for so thank you guys so much. And I also like to highlight that um, SDSU, uh, our Imperial Valley campus, is also host of this event with uh, Mark Wheeler, the Dean of Academic Affairs. All right, thank you guys. Thank you everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you for sharing your insight, I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting us to participate. I really appreciate that. Chat box if we can state our name one more time. So I do want to introduce myself again. My name is Sonia Carter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Thank you for sharing your Saturday with us and, and the opportunity for us to speak to your uh, to your people and, and to or people in your organization. So thank you very much. Yeah, of course, thank you, Jason. And then Okay, all right, well, thank you as well, Sylvia Marquin. And we had so, uh, all right. Okay, so I will be passing over um, the, the mic to Marlene to give a few words. Marlene, you with us? Yes, are you turning it over to me, Johnny? Yes. Okay. Well, Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Real quickly, I would just like to give a shout out of appreciation and thanks to our host, Associated Dean of Academic Affairs at San Diego State University Imperial Valley Campus. And I would also like to introduce Dr. Wheeler and give him a 30 seconds remarks. Dr. Wheeler. Thank you, Marlene. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud of the students, uh, Raul, Lawson, and Johnny for their leadership here. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Imperial Valley Social Justice Committee for their leadership in putting together this forum. Uh, and and I'm, I'm glad that San Diego State University Imperial Valley is supporting this very important forum for democracy in Imperial County. Uh, and I look forward to meeting all of you uh, over time, my wife and I moved here in early June, and we're very glad to be part of the Imperial Valley family. Uh, and again, thank you for being here this morning and supporting democracy in California. Thank you. I'm very glad to have you, Mark. <laughs> All right. And so for our final portion of our con candidate forum today, we are going to go on with the Imperial Valley College Board of Trustees, uh, Area 3. And we have uh, one position that two are running for. We have, we have, let's see, we have Jerry Hart and Hilton Smith. And Jerry, are you, are you with us today? He is in the room, yes. Yes, I am. Oh, okay, definitely. Can you any chance to turn your, your video or? I just, I, okay, there we go. Yes, now I'm there. Awesome, thank you guys. All right, so um, just uh, go again. We have the opening statement for three minutes and then we'll ask a few questions for two minutes, which then we'll have the closing for three. And Raul, could you take time for me, please?
Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so um, can we start off the opening statement, Jerry Hart, for three minutes? Okay. Um, my, my reason for running for this position is I believe that we as a board at Imperial Valley College have been doing a good job in promoting the college and in, in providing services for our students. And we have been open to uh, suggestions uh, and we have been working with the students, we've been working with the staff, we've been working with the community and trying to provide the services that our students need and, and our community deserves. Uh, I was, uh, I'm a K-12 administrator and teacher for 32 years and I have been on the board since 2007. And during that time, uh, I have been uh, representative to Sadika, which is a San Diego Imperial Community College Association, uh, the Imperial Valley College Foundation representative and the Inland Valley Trustee Association, and I travel for the board in our presidential searches. I have served as a board chair for four years, the Sadika Board Alliance chair for two years, and the treasurer for the foundation board most of the time that I was, have been on the board. I was elected to the uh, California Community College Trustees Board of the Community College League of California in 2010 and served three terms, which was the limit that I was allowed to serve. Uh, during my time on the board, I was active in promoting the areas of student success and equity, accreditation, and promoting equitable financing for community colleges. Some of the things that I am most proud of uh, as in, in my tenure as on the board has been, uh, I am really proud of our uh, remodel and, and new buildings that we have been able to accomplish with our bond funds. Uh, with the selection of our last three superintendent presidents and getting our finances in order after the financial crisis and working to, to ensure that all students succeed. All right. All right, Jerry. Um, and that will be about time. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your opening remark. All right. And Hilton Smith, uh, we have our three minute opening remark and you can give us what you'd like to say. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Tilton Smith. I was born and raised here in uh, El Centro, California. I attended uh, Central High School. I graduated in 1971 uh, from Central High School, and then I attended IBC in 1972. Um, as a lifelong resident, uh, but first of all, I got drafted in 1972, uh, so I had to go back uh, to uh, resume my education at IBC, where I got a, a degree in law enforcement. Um, once I received my degree in law enforcement, um, I retired back in uh, 19, a correction, I retired in 2004 uh, from the sheriff's office uh, and went back to work and 2004, between 2004 and 2006 uh, as a bailiff uh, for the uh, courthouse in El Centro. Now, uh, during the time I retired as a bailiff in 2014 uh, from the Imperial County Sheriff's Office. And since uh, my retirement uh, in 2014, I have been directly involved uh, with the community and I am currently a uh, community activist. Uh, so, and, and, and 
one of my main focus uh, as a community activist uh, is uh, focusing on young people. Um, as an activist, I am committed and inspired to encourage young people uh, to get involved in the community and to participate in community projects, uh, whether it's um, assisting the unsheltered, uh, whether it's uh, dealing with uh, disaster relief, such as the recent Nyland fire that we had um, in, in Nyland, uh, whether it's dealing with uh, social, justice, social justice issues or increasing uh, the awareness of their overall civic responsibilities and community awareness. So uh, basically one of my main concern is uh, to be in tune with the community and what their needs are. Uh, so as a board member of the RBC Board of Trustees, I hope to uh, lend my platform uh, to assist those students uh, that are in need. Uh, I, uh, I promote and, and I advocate for uh, affordable uh, quality education. And I think that every student, okay, in Imperial County uh, should be afforded that opportunity to have affordable, equitable education, uh, regardless of your financial disabilities or challenges. Uh, I think that every student should that is, be- That is three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Hilton Smith. And uh, we're gonna start off with you for our first question. Let me just get that right here. Okay. And then this will be a redirect, uh, the same question will be redirected at Jerry Hart as well. So um, starting off Hilton, um, if elected, what will you do to ensure community involvement and that you are responsive to community needs? Yes, uh, like I said before, uh, as a community activist, uh, number one, you have to, in, in, in order to be a good leader, okay, you must be a good listener, okay, and that's one of the skills that I required as a community activist, knowing the needs of the community, okay, and trying to implement those needs uh, to benefit the community. Uh, number one, uh, you must have a, a deep unwavering love for your community, okay? And I possess those skills. Uh, in order to help your community, you must try to understand community and also be in, in tune with the needs of the community. Uh, you cannot be a good leader if you are not in tune with the needs of the community. So therefore, uh, I have those skills of uh, communicating with uh, members of my community, knowing what the needs are and trying to implement those needs. Uh, so, as a uh, board member uh, on the governing board, I think that uh, I would be most uh, beneficial to the students because I can address those needs and I have a um, uh, idea that it's important that you have a student that are easily accessible to you, okay, as a, uh, as a board member. Quite often you find that most, uh, uh, individuals, once they get elected, they tend to not recognize those needs of the students and they are, they are ignored quite often. And uh, those needs are, are not met, okay, to meet the, the, the needs of the, uh, of the students. So I feel that as a board member, okay, on RBC board, I would be totally accessible uh, to uh, students. I will, I will hear their, their, their concerns, uh, their voices, and I will implement uh, policies, okay, to try to provide things that they require for me as a, a board member. All right, thank you, Hilton. All right. And Jerry, uh, did you want me to repeat that question one more time? Yes, if you would, please. Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, so the question is, um, if elected, what will you do to ensure community involvement and that you're responsive to community needs? Oh. First of all, I want to say that I am running for the board as a member of the, the present board because I believe that we are doing a good job in listening to and serving the communities that we 
we represent. Uh, we as a, a board have always been inviting to and available to our constituents. I have participated in many community activities in my district and countywide in an effort to be available. We have invited constituents uh, to forums when we were looking at specific circumstances like coronavirus and social justice and those issues as well. We on the board have supported efforts uh, by uh, the chancellor's office to promote equity and justice for black and African American students by passing a resolution affirming our commitment to their student success. We have passed an, a resolution uh, to commit our, our uh, COVID-19 response to put an emphasis on meeting the needs of the underserved population. While I was on the triple CT board, I was very much involved with the caucuses fighting for the needs of Latinx, Black, Asian, veterans, and LBTG, uh, PQ plus students. Uh, I just feel that, that we need to continue with, with what's happening at IVC right now. And I wanna be on the board in, with the purpose of, of continuing the efforts that we've made up to this point. That is two minutes. All right. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Let me turn off my alarm. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm going to look to the Q&A to see if we have any questions. Okay. All right, let me just pull up one of these right here for you guys. Okay. So I have one right here that's saying that, um, so um, what history do you possess in supporting and listening to fellow community members or students? And uh, this one's gonna, uh, this is for both of, you, both of our candidates and Hilton, um, it's your turn to answer. Okay, I'm sorry, repeat the question one more time for me, please. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, what history do you have in supporting and listening to fellow community members and students? Yes, I have a long history, a, a very long history of uh, listening to uh, the, the community and our fellow students. Like I said before, uh, I have been actively involved on the ground with the community, okay, mm -hmm. and have been actively, actively involved with students and uh, knowing what their needs are and trying to recognize those needs. And uh, like I said before, as a board member, uh, I will, I will uh, use my platform uh, to address those needs uh, of the students. Um, and some of those needs are uh, unemployment, for instance. Uh, those needs are transportation. Um, you know, we have many students at uh, IVC that have problems with transportation getting to school and they are financially challenged. So as a board member, I need to address those needs and rectify those needs in order for every student to have a quali uh, uh, affordable quality education. Uh, in the past, if, if, this is, if this is not an issue, uh, and then uh, this should have been addressed by the previous administrations. And that's why I think it's very important that there need to be a structural change in the governing board of IBC. And I am here as a candidate to make that structural change that can benefit not only the students, but the community as well, okay? Uh, so like I said before, if there isn't an issue of students having issues with transportation, uh, issues with uh, getting affordable quality education, and then those needs might have been addressed. Uh, so obviously there is an issue with that and it has been a, 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 a failed policy of the administration, the prior administration to address those needs and try to implement goals to correct those, those failed policies. That is two minutes for this question. Awesome, thank you, Hilton Smith. And for Jerry Hart, um, I will re read that question one more time. 
And it's, uh, it's going to be, what history do you have in supporting and listening to fellow community members and students? I lost. Sorry about I lost. that? I don't have a sound. Oh. We see you and you hear you, hear you sir. Properly? We see you and we hear you, sir. Okay. I, like I said, I... Could, could you please re repeat the question then? Yes, of course. Uh, the question is going to be, what history do you have in supporting and listening to fellow community members and students? As I said in my opening statement, we as a board have on multiple occasions, on many uh, issues, have invited the community in to discuss issues that were critical to the survival of our, our, our system, our, our college. Uh, I have also been a very uh, uh, active participant in all the activities around the county, uh, being available to my constituents and uh, providing opportunities for them to call me. I, my phone number has been in the book since I was uh, uh, in grade school, and I'm open to questions from anyone who, who makes, it, m makes that telephone call. I also have been, in the, in the year uh, 2018 and 2019, involved with uh, the ASG uh, uh, organizational planning for the school years that that they were representing uh, the students and their, their, the founding of their goals and was very much in, in, in uh, support of that activity. And uh, I, I, I believe that the student uh, uh, organization was appreciative of, of the listening and the opportunities to let me know what their their issues were. All righty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hart. Okay, so I'm just checking for the Q&As. But I hope we have uh, plenty of student viewers in the Zoom today to see, uh, you know, how our future board members can you know. So let me just take a look here. All righty. And this is going to go to Jerry. So this will be for both candidates, just that uh, Jerry is taking over the mic right now. Let's see. Mm. Okay, so this one ensures. So for um, in the college funding, how would you ensure that that the funding goes to empowering and uplifting students. Well, with the requirements, with the uh, student uh, funding formula, uh, we are required to uh, monitor our, our expenditures and we are required to make sure that those expenditures are for the kinds of things that are uh, permitted. We have to look very carefully at, at uh, the funds, uh, what, they're, what they, they are, are for, and to protect the funds so that we can uh, be financially viable in the future. As of, as of right now, uh, we as a board have done several things to ensure that we uh, are financially viable. Right now with the, with the, uh, the, the pandemic and the COVID-19, uh, it's created some, some really uh, uh, difficult situations for the college because we've had to completely shift from from person-to-person uh, uh, -person instruction to complete online instruction. And we have, our college has worked very diligently to 
uh, put together programs that are going to protect our, our, our students, our staff, and our, our public, uh, and yet offer the, 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 the services that we are, are trying to offer in the best way that we possibly can in a safe manner. Uh, and we've even, even worked really hard on, on uh, a plan to uh, reopen and, 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 and use the monies that we have uh, to make sure that, that, that we do things safely. All right, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. All righty. And the same question will be applied to Hilton Smith. Um, the question was being, with college funding, um, how can you ensure an empowering and uplift, uplifting students? Yes, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, number one, uh, if uh, the fundings uh, for the college were spent appropriately, okay, uh, there would not be a need for uh, students being homeless uh, and uh, going to Imperial Valley College. Uh, number one, I think that it is a shame that you have individuals trying to obtain an education uh, that are homeless and uh, who are unsheltered, okay? We need to address those needs of the students and the community. And I believe that if you have a well-educated and well-funded student, okay, they can obviously contribute to the community, okay? as a viable uh, a resource and to uplift the community. If you have a outreach program, okay, that would reach out to those communities that are underrepresented and underserved, uh, particularly people of color, okay, to try to encourage those individuals to get an education, okay, or to attend IBC. And then once you get an uh, a, a education, Okay, you can then invest those resources back into the community. All right. Now, uh, if you have a poorly educated uh, community, you know, you're going to have, a, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to have a, a poorly educated uh, students, uh, you're going to have a poorly funded community. We need to invest money in our students in order to have a productive, viable community. All right, and obviously that has not been happening in Imperial Valley. Uh, number one, we are the highest rate unemployment in Southern California. All right, so it's incumbent upon those individuals who are, who are in control of the funds to be reallocated in order to uplift those individuals in the community. All right, uh, and also to provide those, those students uh, that have needs in order for them to continue their education, okay, to, uh, to, to be viable uh, members of the community once they get their education. So, so my thing is that you have to recognize that if a person has financial disabilities or challenges, we must address those in order for them to receive an education without any kind of uh, impediments. Are, are obstacles, are barriers that will prevent them from getting a quality education. And I think that it's incumbent upon every governing board member to recognize that every student is not the same, okay? They are experiencing different issues and we need to address those issues. And that's why I said it's important that a board member be in tune with the community to know their needs and address those needs directly that can benefit those individuals that uh, are, are experiencing challenges, whether it's a, a mental health challenge, whether it's a uh, childcare challenge, whether it's transportation challenge, whether it's financial challenges. We need to keep our ear on the ground to know what the needs are the, for the community in order to address those needs. And if you don't have an open ear or communication, you cannot address those needs of the, of the student. And I think that yeah. That is two minutes. I'm sorry to cut you off, Hilton, but two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Hilton. Okay, so with that, we will be wrapping up this segment uh, for the Imperial Valley Board of Trustees for IBC. And uh, if you'd like, Hilton, you can uh, close off with your three minute closing statement. Okay. 
Okay, uh, like I said before, um, as a community activist, uh, I am, I am uh, concerned about our community as it stands as a whole right now. And I am totally focused on trying to benefit our community as a whole. And the community consists of IVC students. And um, if you do not address those needs right now, we're going to have a, lo a lot of issues as far as unemployment, uh, uh, as far as individuals being unhoused, uh, meaning unsheltered, okay? Uh, and uh, those individuals who are not given the opportunity to receive an education. And I, I can't stress this enough. It's very important, it's extremely important that those people on the board have a ear, have an ear, and have, a, have the, uh, the wisdom to let students express their voices and their concerns in order for we as a board member can respond to those needs of the students, okay? Because the students are the community, okay? Uh, the, the community and the students are one. You can't have one without the other. They are a part of the community. So if you're not addressing the students' needs, and then you're not addressing the needs of the community and vice versa, okay? So like I said before, there are a lot of underlying issues that have not been addressed in the past. And that's the failure of the administration, the current administration to address those needs and to have an ear on the ground uh, to, uh... can you hear me okay? Thank you. Yeah. To have an ear on the ground okay, to address all those underlying factors that would adversely affect the students from getting an affordable quality education in IBC. It's incumbent upon every board member, okay, to, to, to uh, be accessible to students, not only uh, during a political season, but uh, during the entire academic year, uh, you know, to, uh, no, no, to recognize those needs and to act on those needs and implement those needs that can benefit not only the community, but the students as well. All right. All right thank you, Hilton Smith. And with that, that'll be it for our um, closing statement. And with that, um, Jerry Hart, you're, um, you can close off with three minutes. I, uh would like to close by saying that uh, my top three priorities uh, for uh, the next term, if I'm elected, is to, number one, provide a safe learning environment for all students, staff, and the public that allows all students to succeed. That's uh, number one. Continue to provide for the needs beyond fees and books for our students most in need. Ensure that we are cautious with expenditures to ensure that we continue to be financially viable because one of the issues that we've had in the past was during the, the recession, we had trouble with managing our budget. And those, those are the three things. And I just wanted to, to share uh, some of the things that we have done that I think answers some of those questions as, as far as what the, the present board has done. When it comes to finances, the Imperial Valley College has received uh, an A-plus rating uh, consecutively since uh, 2018. As far as the district reserve, it's been over 20% since 2018. The state's general obligation bond election am i am i is my time up no you're, you're good i just okay uh uh we in 2019 we we approved a a, a, a resolution to make 20 uh 16.6 .6 our, our our reserve amount in 2018 the board approved the transfer of funds from reserve funds to two trusts administered by the Public Agency Retirement Services to designate funds to other post-employment benefits 
and to the SDRS and PERS pension. Uh, the board successfully completed the refunding of general obligation bonds twice, resulting in a gross savings to appro of approximately $4.5 million in debt service savings to taxpayers over the life of the bond. Uh, we have instituted uh, a correctional education program that has, uh, we, we graduated 116 students at both uh, uh, Calipatria Prison and uh, Centinella State Prison. Uh, we have, have reinstituted a dual enrollment program uh, that's created, uh, that offers college courses in lo lo local high schools at no cost to students. And the board has approved, approved the use of the, the gymnasium uh, for an alternative care center to provide medical services to Imperial County COVID-19 patients. As of August 17th, 2013, community members were treated at the alternative care site with an average length of stay of 4.48 days, approximately 955 hospital bed days total. This service enabled our local hospitals to focus resources on the most severely uh, ill COVID-19 patients and undoubtedly saved lives. That's my closing statement. All righty, well, thank you, Please Jerry. vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you guys. I uh, appreciate both you candidates being here. And um, it's really great to hear um, all perspectives of what can be done and what is done at the IVC level. Being a student myself, you know, it's um, very, very beneficial. So I appreciate, I appreciate both of you. Thank you. All right, and I'd like to let um, some of my um, fellow peers here give um, have some closing statement on how everything is and what they thought of our forum. I, oh, but I definitely love to thank everybody here. Definitely for from Ra Raul Rena, Lawson Hardrick, Mark Wheeler, Marlene, and Gretchen. Johnny. And we will and we'll also be having in a, another forum uh, today for the Brawley Candidate Forum. Johnny, and that's gonna, can I interrupt you? Yes. May I please interrupt well, you? I, I think we have one more forum for the Imperial Irrigation District. Isn't that true? Yes. My yeah. dearest apologies. Yeah. So uh, I, I believe that um, Ryan Childers and uh, John Hamby are present for that part of the forum. I will elevate them. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, it, <clears throat> this is Ryan Childers speaking. I was under the impression, uh, based on information that was provided in my campaign, that we were uh, going to be starting our portion of the can the uh, candidates forum at two thirty. And I was just kind of casually listening as I was uh, sitting here doing some other stuff, and I'm not quite ready to go on camera at this exact moment, but uh, I could be shortly. And um, thank you, Mr. Childers, um, Childers. Um, and um, Mr. Hamby, are you similarly? Um, no, I, I, uh, I received the email. I'm, uh, I'm ready to go uh, whenever everybody else is ready. OK. Um, may I recommend that uh, we take a short break um, to provide um, everyone who had a slightly different schedule um, uh, time to get ready. And, and let's make that a five minute break. People can perhaps uh, use this as an opportunity to get something to drink or uh, otherwise uh, take care of themselves. But we will begin again sharply in five minutes. So at 1.26 p.m.
Oh my God, what a... And we'll begin in another 30 seconds or so. And I am uh, proud to uh, turn the room over to President Lawson Hardrick, uh, SDSU uh, student in Imperial Valley, who will moderate. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Wheeler. Um, I do see, I don't see actually uh, Ryan Childers here present. Do we have him in the attendees perhaps maybe? Uh, it seems- Lawson, uh, excuse me. Yes. I just heard from, I just heard from his uh, campaign, and there's some merit in with. I'd also like for Mr. Hammy to uh, be part of this. They're requiring really additional time because they're going by our schedule of two thirty, and um, that is uh, proposed a little inconvenience to them. So they're asking for additional time. Marlene, have they specified how much additional time they would request? Yes, they did. <laughs> they said 30 minutes, but whatever, if we extend their time, whatever the group decides, and with that, it, including Mr. Hamby. Was that three minutes or 30 minutes? 30, three, three, oh, 30. 
Don, are you, um, JB, are you fine with that? Um, it has been confusing because of the switch with IID. So I think we do have time with the, um, within this schedule, if you uh, would be willing to wait 30 minutes. Yeah, uh, sure. That's, that's not a problem for me. Uh, I did get the email. I was under the, the impression we would, things would be moved up a little bit, but I'm happy to uh, be a good team player here. That's wonderful. Um, I think team it's been a, it's been a long morning. Um, I think we could all use 30 minutes if that's okay with everybody here. Uh, Mark, is that all right with you? Uh, as long as um, the, the two candidates uh, are uh, willing, Thank and you. it sounds like they are, um, let's uh, delay starting this segment for 30 minutes, and that would be um, around time of 2 p.m. It's a little yes. more than 30 minutes, but 2 p.m. is a good start time. So, um, Mr. Hanby, if that's okay with you, we'll relay that information to uh, the Childers team, and we'll be back here at 2 p.m. Sounds good to me. I'll grab a bite to eat. <laughs> this webinar, for everybody's purposes, this webinar room will remain open throughout this time. So uh, feel free uh, to stay in, or if you leave, you can use the same, same link to get back in. Sounds good. Thank you all so much. Thank Perfect. you very much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. That's great. <clears throat>
ladies and gentlemen in the audience. Uh, we will begin again in 10 minutes. This is your 10 minute alert. The forum for IID candidates will begin in 10 minutes.
panelists and attendees. We will begin the IID part of the forum in two minutes. Two minute warning. Panelists and attendees, uh, we will begin in 30 seconds. Uh, please uh, get ready to participate and we thank you for your patience. Lawson, I yield the floor to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wheeler. We are waiting for our other candidate, I believe. Let me check if he's on our participant side, okay? Okay, thank everybody for your patience. We are bringing up Ryan Childers. Hello, Ryan. Hello. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Also, thank you, Mr. Hamby, for being here with us as well. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start with our opening statements for you. We'll go ahead and start in alphabetical order. Uh, we will go ahead and start with Ryan Childers. Yes, and it's telling me that I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. You should have access now, sir. Okay. Just a second. Let me see. All right. There we you, are. Are. you are on spotlight. All right. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for hosting this debate. And uh, I believe that the dialogue we have here today is going to be important for voters to be able to decide how they're going to vote in the November 3rd election. The reason I'm running for the Imperial Irrigation District Board of Directors is because the IID is one of our community's most important institutions. The issues it faces are complex and they're of great importance to all of us. Um, and that's why I believe it's important that we elect leaders that have the, um, the experience and the vision to lead the IID and move it forward. Um, and I believe that I bring that experience and that vision uh, to this election. I believe my experience as both a lawyer and my education as an accountant will help me be a more effective IID board member. 
And I believe that my 12 years as a school board member, working with other board members in a collaborative way and making progress on a variety of important issues to our community, make me uniquely qualified to serve in this capacity as an IID board member. Uh, but beyond that, I'm a parent of two children, William and Abigail, who are now 12 and nine years old. And uh, I have a vested interest in seeing that there's opportunity for them to return to here in our community. And without uh, the economic development that the IID can help spur, uh, without a secure water resource, without the protection of our water rights, without a clean environment, without a salt and seed that isn't emitting uh, 8,000 tons of dust into the air as it did uh, this last year and, and expected to go to 20,000 tons in the next four years, then this is not going to be the kind of place that our young people are going to want to return to. Um, but I believe that if we have the right leadership on the IID board, we can make a difference on all these very many important issues, but it's going to take somebody with the right experience, the right vision, and the ability to collaborate with the other four board members to get these important things done. That's why I'm in this race, and that's why I'm asking the voters to vote for me on November 3rd or whenever they receive their mail-in ballots. So thank you again for hosting this, and I look forward to a lively debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your opening statement, Mr. Childers. We are moving on to the opening statement of Mr. Hamby. Thank you, Lawson. Hi, my name is JB Hamby. I'm a candidate for the Imperial Irrigation District Board of Directors, uh, Division Two. I want to just go right into the issues here uh, this afternoon. First, starting with water, going in a little bit about power, and then the Salton Sea and New River issues. Um, looking forward over the next couple of years here, over the next five years on the Colorado River, Imperial Valley is the single largest user on the Colorado River, and the challenges we're facing on the river are attempts to move water from primarily rural communities to continue sprawling growth in other areas across the Colorado River Basin effectively destroying uh, opportunity and quality of life across the river for these communities. It's important that we have a long-term vision there uh, about keeping our water in our valley and cooperating with others in similar situations like the Imperial Valley across the Colorado River Basin to preserve those water resources for their future use and development. Uh, on issues of power, uh, right now we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, just for some context that both the San Diego County Water Authority Co and Coachella Valley Water District, some of our neighboring agencies, they've either had proposed rate increases that they've scaled back or they've significantly reduced their budget or found efficiencies that way that they're not taking out the credit card on the backs of ratepayers, uh, and that we're protecting everybody and especially uh, their wallets in a time of this pandemic when people can't afford higher power bills. And then on the Salton Sea and New River issue, these are long emergencies. We've experienced 80 years in the case of the New River and 17 years in the case of the Salton Sea. We have federal protections when it comes to uh, clean water uh, across the country and clean air as well. And those are both being violated in Imperial Valley, both in the case of the New River and Salton Sea, which are integrally linked. What's in the New River today ends up in our lungs tomorrow as the sea declines, recedes, and all of that toxic dust gets blown into air, into the air, and lungs like mine, uh, for those who have asthma, um, and it's going to create a, a horrific situation that makes Imperial Valley a less desirable place with a lessened quality of life. And everything is downstream from water in Imperial Valley. That's why I'm running for IID to keep our water here because at the end of the day, water is life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your opening statement, Mr. Hamby. We are gonna go ahead and move on to our Q&A section. Um, we're going to continue to follow our alphabetical order here for both of you. So we have a total of four questions right now, and I'm going to go ahead and um, ask one, and we'll start off with you, Mr. Childers. Um, the first question is, what would you propose to avoid disputes between IID and customers in the sense of IID paying millions of dollars in legal fees? Well, this is a a very important question. Uh, the fact is that in the IID's budget, uh, for 2020, they budgeted 7.2, almost uh, $7.3 million for legal fees. Now, some of that uh, just comes along with the territory when you're a nearly billion dollar a year uh, entity, the IID's budget is in excess of $800 million. And so um, an expenditure or an expected expenditure of $7.3 million is a lot of money. Uh, but the IID is a big organization. But where the real issue comes is, as we all know, the IV Press reported uh, earlier this month that it's uh, believed that the total cost 
uh, for the litigation in, in Mr. Abadi's lawsuit against the IID has risen to a total of nearly $3 million on that case alone. And we're expecting to spend many hundreds of thousands, if not back into the seven figures more, as this case continues to work its way perhaps to the Supreme Court. And the final court of appeal would be the United States Supreme Court. Um, now I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't get that far. I'm hopeful that the uh, Supreme Court will do what I think they're going to do and deny hearing of this issue and so that it will be settled and we can move past it. Uh, but to the point about how do we avoid uh, future litigation with customers, well, you know, one thing is we have to engage. Uh, we have to be open and we have to have discussions with all of the stakeholders. And I think, you know, I've found in my experience on the school board that often even when you're going to arrive at a decision that maybe some of the stakeholders don't agree with, if you actually take the time to engage them, listen to them, perhaps modify your plans slightly if, if they make good points, um, and you're likely to get buy-in then from those various stakeholders. Um, and so there are things like the Water Conservation Advisory Board that a lot of the uh, ag community participates in. There are other ag community representatives like the Farm Bureau and, um, and other entities uh, whom I've uh, been out speaking to and listening to. Um, and then there are similar uh, groups on the energy side. Um, and the, the ID board- I apologize board. for interrupting, Mr. Shelters. Your time is up for the question. Thank you so okay, much for Okay, thank you. All right. And um, we are gonna hop on to Mr. Hamby. Uh, Mr. Hamby, would you like for us to repeat the question? Uh, no, no, I think I got it. Um, let me just start off by saying the IID is a, a unique creature uh, in, in many ways, very much different than in cities or county or school districts or, or many other special districts. The IID has invaluable resources that it's, it's charged to protect. That's both water and, and power. And many of these things that IID has, if you lose them, you lose them forever. Uh, that's not quite the case in, in many of our other sort of districts or, or local governments. So the important thing about that is when it comes to legal fees and this sort of thing, I, I do believe that when you're, you're, you're paying especially for uh, this very important litigation, both on power and water issues, uh, that really the, the legal stuff is, is a drop in the bucket in, in the grand scheme of the IID's uh, seven to $800 million budget annually. So I think that's a, a pretty good investment as long as, as attorneys and, and firms are being used and directed as, as appropriate. Um, and this is especially the case as we're moving forward uh, trying to prevent unnecessary expenses where they don't need to incur and investing in places you really do when we're protecting the things that matter most. One example of that is, is we're moving forward with the Coachella Valley Service Territory and what the future holds for that. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the best uh, brain trust possible uh, because there's a lot to that agreement and the future of the Coachella Valley Service Territory that is very uncertain. And uh, it, it's, it's worthwhile to make sure that you have proper legal uh, footing and preparation in advance of these really significant long-term challenges. Thank you, Mr. Happy, for your response. We're gonna move on to question number two here. Um, okay, Mr. Childers, question number two is, over 55% of users live in Riverside County. Do you think IID customers in Riverside area should have representation from the IID board? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're right. 60% of the uh, users uh, or customers for IID power come from the Coachella Valley. But the Imperial Irrigation District is an irrigation district who through the 1934 agreement um, and also special district law and approvals by LAFCO, both uh, Imperial and Riverside County, was allowed to extend electrical service outside of its service area um, to the folks in Coachella. Uh, but we cannot afford to allow representatives from Coachella to sit on our board that makes the most important decisions about the future of our valley as it relates to our water rights. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a non-starter. Uh, there has been uh, legislation that's been proposed by State Senator Chad Mays out of the Riverside area. It was AB 854, Assembly Bill 854, which proposed to stack our board with board members elected out of the Coachella Valley and that would have, in essence, allowed them to have a, vo a vote and a voice on the issues related to our water rights, and we can never allow that. And so that must be fought and stopped at all costs. And I, I intend to uh, continue that fight when I'm elected to the IID board. 
Thank you very much for your response, Mr. Childers. We are moving on to the same question for Mr. Hanby. Mr. Hanby, do you need us to repeat the question? No, I, I, I got that one. Yeah, the, the situation we have going on in the Coachella Valley, there's been some discussion and, and various phrases used up there to try and justify double representation, both on the Coachella Valley Water District Board and the IID Board. It's important to look back at the history of, of where this exactly came from. So in 1933, after the Boulder Canyon Project Act was passed in, in, in 28, what happened was the Department of the Interior was looking to build the All-American Canal as it was instructed to by Congress. And the intent there, at least from Interior's perspective, was why do we need to have two separate districts? Why don't we have one large Imperial Irrigation District covering the two areas? Uh, the few people that lived in the Coachella Valley at the time when it was mostly, as it was described back then, jackrabbits and sand hills, uh, very strongly objected to that. They, there was lots of problems with the IID at the time in terms of the immense debt that was uh, accumulated to create this whole thing that we enjoy today. Um, but ultimately, as part of that 1934 agreement of compromise, what they agreed to was that we would serve as power in the Coachella Valley. They would have their own water district, and there was a few other things that were part of that. It was primarily a water agreement, settling a lot of disputes there. Um, but it's now come to be this very odd sort of situation, which, as you mentioned, lost in 55% of, of the power revenues or of the revenues, perhaps overall, are coming from Coachella. Um, we need to work better as we're moving forward with the, the Coachella folks. I think there are ways to smooth some things over, but there are some lines that we will not cross and cannot cross. And double representation, especially representation from Coachella whatsoever, whether it be on water energy or both on the IID board is, is just simply not appropriate. It wasn't what was intended at, at the very beginning and we should not have that going forward. Thank you, Mr. Hamby, for your response. We're gonna move on to our third question here. Uh, Mr. Childers, in your opinion, why and who owns the Colorado water brought into the valley? So if the question is about the water that is flowing into the Imperial Valley from the Colorado River, um, that's a pretty easy question to answer as the water code specifically addresses this. And what it says is that the IID holds the uh, water rights in trust for the benefit of the users within its service area. And so that means all of us, uh, and that includes uh, landowners, it includes businesses and business owners, it includes homes and homeowners, it includes people that live in apartments, uh, it includes anybody in our service area for the IID that uses water. And I think the recent Court of Appeals decision from the Fourth District Court of Appeals on the Abadi versus IID case uh, further explain this. And they went on to say that, um, as has been said in past case law, like Bryant v. Yellen, that the water rights of the Imperial Irrigation District are appurtenant to the land within the service area of the IID. Uh, but then further clarified that what that means is that is a, a, a water right to have the service of water to that land. Um, but I think that it's important uh, that we acknowledge the attachment to the land as we anticipate future fights um, to come and, and try and take more of our water from us and try and undermine those water rights. Uh, but again, I think that this, this um, recent case from the Fourth District Court of Appeals really clarified a lot of questions that had been out there uh, previously, and I think that it's going to pave the way um, to reduce, hopefully, the number of fights, at least within our own community, uh, over some of the issues, the very important issues that were settled by that case. Thank you so much. Perfect timing. So we are going to move with the same question on to Mr. Hamby. Sure. Thank you, Lawson. Yeah, the, the, um, here's a, a, a better demonstration of how the water situ work, situation works and, and the, the question of ownership. What's interesting is, well, let me actually start off like this. So the IID possesses a contract dating back to the, after the creation of the Hoover Dam and all the work that went into that in the early days with Interior. And so the way it's apportioned everyone downstream from Hoover Dam and the lower basin states is that there are contracts to individual users. In some cases, there are in, are in Arizona, for instance, individuals parcels of land that have contracts. And what a contract is, is a right to use a certain amount of water on a certain amount of land. And in the case of Imperial, which is very fortunate for us, we have one single contract that covers the entire Imperial Valley 
area, I had to use water service territory, which is not only the, the, the 500,000 roughly irrigated acres of land, but also includes a total of about a million acres uh, uh, total, both irrigated, non-irrigated. So the IID possesses that contract, which is nothing is in dispute there. And then the second part of that, IID takes that water from the Colorado River, delivers it to those who need it for a variety of purposes in the Imperial Valley. And those who need it have a right to service, which means you are not quantified at any amount. You can literally order from IID with your, your, with your iPhone as much water as you need, uh, as long as your use is reasonable and beneficial. So I think that's one thing that has been pretty harmful over time is trying to turn these things into a discussion about ownership because no one really owns it. We all know it's a public resource, more so it's a resource for use in Imperial Valley. We should not be selling it to other places because that's been so devastating to the Imperial Valley, most specifically at the Salton Sea and to everyone when it came to our economy. Um, and so you'll hear different versions of this all along the Colorado River and discussion of ownership. Uh, Yuma is very strong about their position that individual landowners don't own water. Uh, they're facing a lot of pressures of individual uh, hedge funds trying to buy water, separate the water from, from the land that the contract is for and move it into other places. But in this context, no one owns the water. It, IID has a contract. Those who need it in Imperial Valley have a right to service. And that's simply the way it works. Thank you so much. Perfect timing as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our final question here that we have for you. Um, okay, this one is long, but it's good, like all the other questions. So I'm going to go ahead and read it slowly. You both enjoy support within the agricultural communities. In light of the appellate court ruling in the Abadi lawsuit against IID, which found that IID holds the Imperial Valley's water rights for the beneficial interests of all its water uses, what is your position on this appellate ruling? And how will you defend this public resource if you are elected to the IID board? We can start off with Mr. Childers. Yes, and I think uh, many of my comments in the previous question probably already addressed this, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and reiterate uh, my position. I believe that the Fourth District Court of Appeals decision in the Abadi versus IID case was a very well-reasoned, well-drafted, uh, well thought out legal opinion that has a strong standing in uh, prior legal precedent. Uh, and I think it positions the IID and the people of Imperial Valley in a, a strong position moving forward to continue to, def to defend our, our water rights. Uh, my concern is, is when my opponent says that, they're, that no one really owns the water, well, if, if no one owns it, um, then what's to stop someone from coming and taking it? I understand that we have uh, contracts with the federal government or a contract in our case with the federal government. Uh, but these things are subject to legislative change and so forth if we don't stand up and say that our water rights uh, are, are uh, sacrosanct and they do amount to some uh, version of ownership at least um, so that the water cannot be taken uh, with just some legislative action on the part of the federal government. Um, so, so that's concerning to me, but nonetheless, um, my position is, again, that it's, it's uh, held in trust by the IID for the benefit of everybody, every individual uh, who uses water within the IID service area. And uh, I will continue to support, if elected, the IID defending this case. If, this, if the Supreme Court does decide to uh, take it up and hear it, then uh, this is, is the most important investment we'll ever make uh, in terms of uh, spending on legal fees to defend our water rights, because without that water, as we all know, uh, this valley looks very, very different, and it's not a place that, that many of us would want to continue to, to live. Thank you, Mr. Childers. We're moving on to Mr. Handy. Yeah, a little bit of context there. As was just mentioned, uh, attempts to try and change things from what they are and always have been into something entirely new. So as we saw during the entire QSA period, there were attempts to try and change things as they've always been into something entirely new to make things more secure. And so that's a, that's a real serious concern there because attempting to change things from how they've been since they were set up with the compact Boulder Canyon Project Act and since the very beginning uh, is very dangerous. And that's not, those are not doors we should open. This is what we're seeing going on in, along the Colorado River in Arizona and the potential impacts for us in Imperial Valley is trying to change things as they've been set up and been for nearly a century. 
and, and change it in ways that would benefit certain people or certain interests. So I'm very concerned by that. We need to preserve the contract as it is, as it's always been, add nothing new in courts, add nothing new in legislation. That water is for the entire service area of the Imperial Irrigation District and needs to be used here, not moved anywhere else. And that's why we are so strong about our two-third public vote thing, which is two-thirds of the people should have the ultimate decision over whether any water move, moves out of Imperial Valley. It shouldn't be a handful of growers. It shouldn't be three people on an IID board. It shouldn't be any special interest that could pull enough money or influence together to make a deal to send more water out of here. I only trust the people of Imperial Valley. You shouldn't have to trust me or anyone else on the board uh, or Mr. Childers or anywhere else. You should trust yourself and have the ultimate judgment, which is why we're pushing for the two-third public vote to have only the people in the position to make that decision. We've done it over the past, over the last century of the Imperial Irrigation District, when it came to the formation of the Imperial Irrigation District in 1911 with a public vote, with the All-American contract, in 1919, with even uh, the IID board in 1985, putting in a, a, a resolution together that required any transfers out of the valley to require a public vote. That, that was unfortunately revoked the very next year by another board that was more interested in transfers. But the two third vote is really the thing that's going to keep this valley whole and put the power ultimately in the people's hands, not anybody else's. Thank you so much for your response. We are wrapping up our questions that we have to you. Thank you for your very fluid responses. Uh, we do have a question from the audience from a member known as, um, I have his name here, Daniel K. Edwards. He would like to ask for both candidates. So we'll also go in um, ABC order again, and we'll start off with Mr. Childers, okay? So um, Mr. Edwards would like to ask, um, please share with us who or whom are your top three financial contributors? Um, let's see. My top three, I don't have the, the uh, disclosure right in front of me. Um, but my top three would be um, a farming operation called Lantana Farms, I believe. Um, another one, uh, La uh Produce LLC, I believe is the correct name of the entity. Um, and then the third one, I'm not, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, it may be one of uh, the uh, geothermal companies. Uh, who have been very generous in their support of my campaign because they know that I am a candidate that is going to fight for economic development and the uh, development of our geothermal resources. Uh, but regardless of who has contributed to my campaign, uh, there is nothing about a campaign contribution that is going to change anything in terms of my core values and my uh, definitive commitment to doing what is right for the Imperial County. And money will not change that. I wouldn't be in this race if I was going to be subject to influence because someone chose to give me uh, some money for my campaign. I'm in this race and I believe people are supporting me financially because they know that I'm a person of integrity and someone who is going to do what they think is right for the Valley. And the folks that are supporting me want to see uh, what's, what's right for the Valley done for the Valley. And, and that's why they're supporting me. Thank you so much for your response. We are moving on to Mr. Hamby. Do you need us to repeat the question for you? No, I, I got it. And uh, ditto to uh, what most of uh, Mr. Childers said with the exception of the, the, the donors there. So top three for me are uh, number one is our, my family's business, which is Sandia Tech. Number two is myself personally. And then number three is my good friend, uh, John Hawk, uh, farmer, Holtville area. Thank you so much for your response. We have an additional question. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start off with Mr. Childers again. This question is um, very simple. Um, what do you think separates you from the other candidate running for this position? Well, without question, uh, what separates me from Mr. Hamby is my longstanding uh, ties to the community of El Centro, born and raised in division two um, and have spent uh, most of my adult life uh, here in El Centro and Division Two, and, and so I have been working here. I have been contributing to this community. I have been serving on El Centro school boards for 12 years. I've been past president of the El Centro Rotary Club, and so the El Centro division that I'm seeking to represent is my home, and it always has been, uh, but beyond that, I think what separates me from Mr. Hamby is experience. 
uh, no doubt, uh, I've been very impressed with Mr. Hamby's intellect and eloquence, um, and those are all very important things. But to serve on a board with four other members uh, and to deal with the things that uh, is required of an IID board member simply requires the experience of having done similar things in the past. Uh, and there's a reason why we value experience uh, as, as a society, uh, because it, we build on our past experiences. We've all made mistakes in the past, and we learn from those mistakes. But we can't have a, afford to have someone stepping onto something as important as the IID board as their first real job and having making those mistakes for the first time as an IID board member. We need people who have already made those mistakes and are ready to stand up and do this job on day one and, and do it in a way that is going to protect what's so important uh, for the Imperial Valley. Thank you, Mr. Childers, for your response. We are moving on to Mr. Handy. Yeah, thanks, Lawson. I, I think the, uh, the, the separating thing here is, is really, for me, preparation. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Many of our founders were under the age of 30 years old when they either signed the Declaration of Independence or were involved in the drafting of the Constitution. Similarly, Congressman Phil Swing was a very young man when he was city attorney locally, when he was helping IID. And he was part of the, he was a district attorney at the time, either deputy or, or then district attorney, among other things, and was very helpful in IID's efforts in the, uh, in the Colorado River Compact, first of all, which was a, a big tote task, and, and traveled the entire Colorado River Basin, making much of what we have today and, and forming much of the law of the river as a young man himself. So I, I think really the, the thing here to focus on is preparation. Myself, I've traveled the Colorado River's much of any stretch I've been able to make it to over the past number of years. It's something I'm very passionate about. I'm passionate about keeping our water in Imperial Valley and have attended over 25 to, to 30 conferences across the Colorado River and have been able to make so many partnerships, relationships with people of all stretches of the Colorado River Basin, which is so essential as we're moving forward to 2026 and those discussions on the Colorado River, ensuring that we have preparation in order that can only come through preparing oneself for these important matters when it comes to water and, and the long-term view of what's going to be happening across the Colorado River Basin over the next century, which is all going to be done over the next five years or so, which is something that kept me up at night a lot and is one of the things that made me most uh, concerned enough to, to run for this office. And, and I'm so happy to, to share that it's that preparation and that, that passion that is uh, Earn the support of, of so many of the people of El Heber, El Centro, and Sealy in Division Two, and, and I'm have so glad to have earned their support and trust in, in March as the first place uh, winner there. Thank you very much for your response. I'd like to go ahead and just give a, a big, great thanks. Um, those are all of the questions we had today. Um, I would like to go ahead and have us start um, our closing statement. So we'll go ahead and start with Mr. Childers. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to the committee for hosting this debate. And uh, I'd like to, if I could, just take a moment that I have here to address an issue. Uh, in the prior question about the uh, contributors to our campaign, um, I was answering that question excluding myself. Um, if myself were included, then I would clearly be the largest contributor to my campaign. I have committed a substantial amount of my own resources to this effort because I'm not running for this uh, uh, because I want to benefit myself. I'm running for this because I want to benefit the community. And so I'm willing to make that investment of my own, not just time, but money. And so I wanted to make that clear that if we, if we look at it that way, then I certainly am my own top contributor. But um, having said that, I, I'd like to ask the voters uh, to take the time to take a look at the records of the two candidates, uh, take a look at what uh, the two candidates are putting out there as their position statements, uh, and ask yourself, uh, who has the experience to actually get some of these things that they're talking about done? And in my case, I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I'm asking you to look at my track record, what I've done, what I've been doing. And I think you'll find that you'll come to the conclusion that I'm the candidate that has that experience to actually do what they say they're going to do. And uh, I'm looking forward to bringing a fresh perspective and energetic leadership to the IID, and I'm going to work to make it more effective and more efficient and better able to serve our community. 
because again, the decisions we make now impact not only us, but they impact future generations of Imperial Valley residents. And that's what I'm looking to is the future, not the past, but the future. And so um, I'm asking voters of Division Two, please remember to vote on November 3rd for Childers for IID or whenever you receive your mail-in ballot, those are gonna be going out the week of October 5th. You can wait till November 3rd if you'd like, but you can mail those in sooner, certainly. And when you do, please remember, Childers for IID Division Two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Childers. Mr. Hamby, please proceed with your closing statement. Sure thing. And, and thank you, uh, Lawson and the, the Social Justice uh, Committee here for, for your effort in, in putting this together. Uh, I do want to share that it, it is so important to have experience, and, and that, is, that is no doubt, um, but also right experience and, and relevant experience. I'm so happy to have, over the past several years, prepared myself in such a way that I didn't imagine several years ago I would, would ever be pursuing this, but it's, it is out of this incredible concern um, for the future of this valid, most especially when it comes to water that we very well could have a future that, that doesn't look very good. And it's those decisions that are made at the IID board and the enormous pressures that we're feeling across the Colorado River Basin. The, the issues at IID are, are not local in many ways. It's a, it's a local agency meant to serve the, the people who live here. Um, but the pressures are regional. They are statewide and, and, and across the Colorado River Basin and they're international as well. And so we have to have preparation on the IID board that's going to best put us forward, especially on those decisions coming ahead in 2026 on the Colorado River to ensure that we keep our water here and that we're not constantly losing more and more water and having a smaller and shrinking salt and sea and diminished future for this valley, which comes from the loss of this resource. It's also important as we're recovering from the coronavirus that we're not raising our power bills at a time when it's the least opportune when people have less money in their pockets than ever before uh, that we would do such a thing or engage in practices that would would leave less money for people to to pay to keep their mini split air conditioner going in their 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 trailer or whatever their case might be i don't think that's fair and i think that's patently unjust and when it comes to the new river and salt sea there's been many commitments made over time especially at the state and national level that have not been worth the paper that were written on. And I believe that those get addressed as part of 2026 if we have the leadership, uh, leadership that's going to work for the future of Imperial Valley that takes from the best of our past, learns from the historic mistakes we've made and doesn't make them again. And I think that with new and relevant experience, we'll be able to build a brighter future for Imperial Valley, keep our resources here and serve the people here first before anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Childers and Mr. Hamby for your closing statements. And thank you again for being here with us today. We really appreciated you being here and listening to all of your questions, your responses and everything that you shared with us today. Um, we were gonna have Marlene come up and um, close it up for everyone, but um, she is unable to um, speak at this moment. So I will go ahead and close it up for everyone. So again, thank you for listening and taking the time to empower yourself with the information to make an informed decision. Once again, thank you all for participating and do not forget to vote. Any, um, any other panelists have any closing remarks? Gretchen, if you would like to remind people about the uh, forum for tonight. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yes, we have a, another forum, believe it or not, tonight um, from five o'clock to eight o'clock for Brawley candidates. Um, and the I can I'll read the Zoom ID number twice, just in case people haven't received the flyer or don't have the information. The number, uh, the Zoom ID number to join from five to eight this evening is nine three four five five zero. 10713. That's 934 550 10713. And thank you, candidates, for running. Thank you to all the Imperial Valley College and San Diego State um, 
students and to Mark, uh, to Marlene, of course, and the whole Imperial Valley uh, Social Justice Committee. This is the fifth year, I believe, that we've done candidate forums. It's the first year that we've done a um, Zoom forum. So thanks for having patience with us. <laughs> we did Calexico last week. Uh, this is our second one. And then Brawley's this afternoon. Thank you all for supporting democracy in the Valley. Uh, look forward to meeting you in person someday after this pandemic relents. See you tonight in Brawley. Are we gone or are we still here, everybody? We're gone, right? I am here, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'll probably be here for the rest of time. <laughs> well, you're in a beautiful spot. If it's only virtual, but you're still in a beautiful spot. Um, so that was good, right? We still have uh, 10 attendees uh, who are in our uh, Zoom webinar room and, and they are still hearing us. Um, so uh, I, I think I will remove everyone. Okay. And then we can talk. Okay. There we go. Now we're, now we're. <laughs> okay, good. Now we are us. We are us. Great job, Lawson. Johnny. Johnny, you stepped in to do that at the last moment and you did great. And don't <laughs> I, feel. It was my first time. I'm a little, a little nervous. All you three. are natural. That was great. <laughs> all three of you were fantastic because you were all um, so polite, so clear. I was really nice. Right, Mark? Oh, I thought it was wonderful. And um, I thought that as Zoom webinars go, the visuals and the audio were very smooth and connected. Right. So everybody, I think, had a good sort of televised experience. I'm going to shut the recording off. Um, we will have um, 